Good afternoon. Our next item of business today is a debate on motion 14962 in the name of Kevin Stewart on ending homelessness together. And I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons uh, as soon as possible. And oh, right, I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Eileen Campbell, uh, to speak to and move the motion. So before I start, though, I would like to take the chance to congratulate the men and women who represented Team Scotland at the Homeless World Cup in Mexico earlier this month. The players' determination, drive and spirit is inspiring and their participation plays a crucial role in changing attitudes and perceptions of homelessness. Uh, they have all done Scotland uh, incredibly proud. And that leads me on to what today's debate is all about, moving forward with the actions we need to take to tackle homelessness with determination and drive in order to provide people with the support and homes they need. Because everyone should have a safe, warm place they can call home. Home is a place where we feel secure, have roots and a sense of belonging. It supports our physical and emotional health and well-being. And that is why the publication earlier this week of our high-level action Ending Homelessness Together is so important. It translates the aspirations and recommendations from the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group into tangible actions. Actions that will, by working in partnership, end homelessness and rough sleeping and transform temporary accommodation. And crucially, it's not just our view that this plan will help transform our approach to homelessness. Crisis Chief Executive and Chair of the Action Group John Sparks and Lorraine McGrath from the Simon community said in an article at the weekend that the plan will cement Scotland's position as a world leader in securing the human right to housing that every citizen should have. And Sally Thomas, Chief Executive of the Scottish Federation of Housing Association said, the publication of this action plan gives us an historic opportunity to make a real difference to the lives of vulnerable people across Scotland facing homelessness. This plan keeps Scotland at the global forefront of tackling homelessness and builds on what are already the strongest rights for homeless people in the world, with everybody found to be homeless legally entitled to housing. And there is much positive work to build on. Our focus on prevention through five regionally grouped housing options hubs has contributed to a 39% reduction in homelessness applications over the last eight years. We have delivered over 78,000 affordable homes since 2007 and are on track to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of this parliament, including 35,000 for social rent backed by more than three billion pounds. But the reality is we need to do more. And for some, finding accommodation and support at a time when they need it most can be a struggle and homelessness and housing insecurity remains a reality for too many. That is why, building on our work so far and driven by our ambition to create a fairer, equal Scotland, we are resolute in our commitment to work towards a Scotland that has no place for homelessness and rough sleeping. That commitment to end rough sleeping and homelessness was set out last autumn by the First Minister and backed by funding of £50 million over five years, and is why the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, HARSAG, was set up. HARSAG was asked to identify the actions needed to end rough sleeping and homelessness, and how we could transform temporary accommodation. Chaired by Crisis CEO John Sparks and a variety of experts and stakeholders, HARSAG worked at a remarkable pace to first produce a set of concrete actions for preventing rough sleeping last winter and then on to develop 70 bold recommendations. In addition to this work by HARSAG, the Scottish Parliament's Local Government and Communities Committee inquiry into homelessness reported on their recommendations earlier this year. I want to thank both HARSAC and the committee for these two pieces of work, important both in driving the momentum and pace of change needed to make good on the vision to create a person-centred system and an end to homelessness in Scotland. Grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. She talks about the pace for change. Her report references the state of temporary accommodation but says new standards won't be in place till 2023. Does she really think that's the sort of pace of change we're looking for? Cabinet Secretary. We continue to work with partners and of course we are saying this and taking forward these actions with a recognition that we need to do more and we'll continue to do more and we'll work in partnership to change the culture and ensure that those who need housing and who, and who need support get that support when they need it. And we recognise that there are areas that we need to concentrate on and areas that we need to do more on. But the recommendations and actions seek to transform current approaches and culture by ensuring that it is people, not just stats or numbers or targets that are at heart. And to do so required the voice of lived experience to shine through and shape and hone what we do and what we should do. 
And through a project called I We Can, led by the Glasgow Homelessness Network, Harsard heard from over 400 people with lived experience to understand what would have helped it better support them. Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wonder if uh, the experience of one homeless person whom I regularly see sitting on a pavement in Edinburgh uh, might inform this. Uh, there are dangers to which he and others are exposed that we wouldn't think of. There are traffic accidents took place, a vehicle left the road. He got three cracked ribs when it hit him. Is that not exactly the kind of experience that we are all working, I hope, together uh, to avoid too many people being exposed to that kind of danger. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I think all voices and all views and the lived experience work that has been carried out by Kevin Stewart, the Harsai Group and others has been critical in shaping and honing the work that we're taking forward. And that's not going to just stop now that the work has uh, completed and the action plan is now published. That will continue to feed through into what we do. As to well, in all, a host of other uh, areas of work across the government, it's lived experience that is uh, crucial in helping us get our policies right. And Harsag has also listened to the views of the dedicated frontline staff who day in, day out continue to make a difference to those experiencing homelessness. And these views have been crucial in terms of informing the actions set out in their high level action plan. Embedding a person-centred approach is central to our plans. This is to both significantly improve the experience of homeless people, but to also drive forward the systemic change needed to end homelessness. And that's why in partnership with local government, housing and delivery partners, we will develop an Ending Homelessness Together lived experience programme. And this will ensure the engagement that got us to this place will not stop and will enable a continuation of listening to people with lived experience and frontline staff. But importantly, it won't just be listening, it'll be about acting and responding to those messages to ensure change and improvement. And it's because we know there is no single path into homelessness, but in reality, a variety of social and economic factors that means helping someone to resolve their housing needs demands a personalised, tailored response that is agile and adaptable. Therefore, we will work with local government and housing and delivery partners to give people experiencing homelessness greater control and choice and ensure services are working with them to build a package of support that will lead to positive future outcomes. This will include the development of policy options and how new personal housing plans will work alongside a housing options approach. And we'll continue to listen to frontline staff and ensure they are well equipped to carry out their work with high quality training, including in trauma, addictions and mental health. And we'll work with our partners to ensure systems, policies and procedures empower frontline staff, placing resources in their hands, which allow them to make the best decisions centred around the needs of the person that is in front of them. And that will be supported by the development of the Housing Options Training Toolkit, which will see the first modules delivered in spring 2019. Where children are homeless, a wellbeing assessment will be undertaken in relation to each child in the household to ensure any additional learning or so social support is put in place. And we'll continue to explore what measures can be put in place to prevent rough sleeping and homelessness for those without recourse to public funds, working in partnership with COSLA and others to ensure clear guidance and training is provided and disseminated to uh, key audiences. And together with partners, including local authorities, the third sector and people with lived experience, we will develop a public perceptions campaign to challenge misconceptions about homelessness. We know though that there are some groups of people who are at greater risk of becoming homeless, including people fleeing of violence and abuse, people leaving the care system and those leaving prison. So we'll work with partners to develop clear pathways to avoid homelessness in their groups, uh, briefly. I raised with the Minister for Housing on several occasions LGBT young people and the fact that 40% of those young people who declare themselves homeless in Edinburgh do so because they've had difficulty coming out, yet I can find no reference to that in the main body of the report. Why not? And they have uh, LGBT, uh, re uh, LGBT representatives have been uh, involved with the development of many of the policies that were taken forward today. And again, we'll continue to work with the member if, if she wants around making sure that that is very clear to her because it has been clear and it has been very much at the uh, centre of the work that we're taking forward, recognising that so many different groups and organisations and people have particular needs and we need to make sure that that's reflected in the policies that we take forward. It, for instance, the SURE standards for ensuring everyone has sustainable housing in place on release from prison are a, an example of a pathway and we're already working in partnership with local authorities and Scottish Prison Service to support their implementation in every area. And in all cases, successful prevention of homelessness will rely on better, more consistent joint working between various agencies and sectors. And we know that getting this right will also bring multiple benefits for the people that we serve. 
For instance, our new drug and alcohol strategy, Rights, Respect and Recovery, highlights how vital having a safe and secure home is for prevention of and recovery from problematic alcohol and drug use. And when someone who is vulnerable or at risk and seeks help, it shouldn't matter who they turn to or to what organisation. Our system needs to be person-centred, trauma-informed and agile with an adoption of a no-wrong-door culture that enables the person to get the help they need when they need it. And in pursuit of an approach based on effective prevention requires a culture change for all organisations that deal with people at risk of or experiencing homelessness. And getting that right is important and again was articulated in the article by John Sparks and Lorraine McGrath. Homelessness also needs to be solved with pace, again taking on building on the points that uh, Kezia Dugdale has uh, made. Rapid rehousing seeks to secure a settled mainstream housing outcome for households as quickly as possible. And part of this solution will require a transformation in the use of temporary accommodation, meaning time spent in any form of temporary accommodation should be reduced to a minimum with the fewer transitions the better. Being settled in a home with the right support enables that sense of well-being, community and belonging. And we need to recognise the importance of settled housing as the foundation for a person to tackle an array of challenges, including addictions, mental health, physical health, employment and avoiding offending and reoffending. We want to see a significant shift towards rapid rehousing by default, including housing first for those it is appropriate for. Housing first provides ordinary settled housing as a first response for people with multiple needs. Housing First recognises a safe, secure home is the best base for recovery and for addressing other challenges uh, in life. And that's why we've already allocated £23.5 million from the Ending Homelessness Together Fund and Health Portfolio to support that transition, with up to £6.5 million of that supporting our partnership with Social Bite, who are working with the Cora Foundation, Glasgow Homelessness Network and third sector partners to deliver Housing First pathfinders in Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh, Glasgow and Stirling. The production of rapid rehousing transition plans, including Housing First, will be a fundamental and central uh, plank of the changes to come over the coming years. And planning is now entering the final stages across the 32 local authorities, with plans due to be submitted in December for implementation from April uh, next year. And of course, we'll focus on our efforts of preventing homelessness when homelessness does occur on effective response is crucial to safeguard people to prevent that issue which caused the homelessness in the first place becoming worse. And that's particularly true of individuals who are, are at risk of rough sleeping. Last year, through the Winter Initiative, we showed how we can make a difference to those with long experiences through uh, rough sleeping, extremely poor health and a consistent struggle with engaging with support. And we'll continue to support local winter planning, uh, working with uh, practitioner experts to develop an improved response to up safeguard people risk, uh, sleeping rough or at risk in our cities and urban centres this winter and all year round. And today, Kevin Stewart announced £370,000 to be spent on frontline uh, outreach activity this winter, bringing spending on this to £918,000 since this time last year. And this money will support additional emergency accommodation for those sleeping rough, improve the join up between statutory and third sector services in Edinburgh and provide another 50,000 of frontline flexible funding to empower street outreach staff to make immediate changes for the person they are working with then and there. So we will continue to work uh, with our partners, continue to make good on the actions that we have set out and continue to uh, be ambitious on this area. Uh, and we won't, however, uh, uh, cease uh, the action, the momentum that has built up to get us this place. We will continue to deliver on our actions set out to create a person-centred, holistic system that has prevention at its heart and delivered by empowered staff who can respond quickly to need. And in doing so, we'll make good on our ambitions to eradicate homelessness in Scotland. But we're not blind to the challenges that remain. And that's why it'll continue, it'll be continue to be necessary to work in partnership with everyone who has that vision and ambition at their heart. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Graham Simpson to speak to and move Amendment 14962.1. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, this is an important debate. Um, how we help those most in need is a measure of society's values. We've come a long way in the debate on homelessness in this parliamentary term. I took part in the year-long inquiry by the Local Government and Communities Committee, which preceded, and I would say led to, the government setting up the Homeless and Rough sleep Sleeping Action Group. The committee and HARSAG produced broadly similar recommendations uh, which bring us here today. I first of all want to commend the government and Kevin Stewart for acting on those recommendations. And I was pleased to read 
the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan on Tuesday, although, as with most government documents, quite a bit of it was waffle. It was, though, overall a positive document. The focus on a person-centered approach, on prevention, uh, on providing settled homes for all, and joining up resources are right. Our amendment today, which I move, takes nothing away from the government motion which we support. It focuses on unsuitable temporary accommodation. Research by crisis on unsuitable temporary accommodation, mainly B&Bs and hostels, shows that 60% of residents were subject to curfews. Curfews, for goodness sake. These people are not criminals. Three out of four weren't allowed visits from family and friends, and 81% of those found that relationships suffered. No surprise there. 45% said they had no access to a kitchen, so skipped meals. These lives in limbo should not be tolerated. That's why all opposition parties put our name to a statement at the weekend, calling on the government to bring in a change in the law to put a seven-day limit on the time people can spend in such accommodation. Yes, I will. Kevin Stewart. Um, can I say, presiding officer, that the government will support um, Graham Simpson's uh, amendment today. Uh, we recognise that work needs to be done here. Uh, we will consult on all of this at a very early stage next year uh, and bring forward um, legislation in due course uh, to tackle this. Um, I think um, uh, I, uh, I would thank Mr Simpson for bringing this forward and I would also urge all members uh, to read the uh, Harriet Watt study which came out on Monday around about temporary accommodation in Scotland uh, to get a grasp of how we need to personalise uh, these services uh, much, much more. Graeme Simpson. Thanks. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that uh, from the Minister. Um, we, you know, we, we've said that the, uh, the government should announce this in the next programme for government, and I think that's a realistic time frame. It means that something will now happen. The Local Government and Communities Committee inquiry was detailed, harrowing at times, but rewarding um, if it leads to action. We met many, many homeless people, and I've met more subsequently, some just minutes walk from here, queuing up every night to bed down on the floor of a church hall at Meadowbank, moving and unsettling. The committee visited Finland, where frankly it was the inspirational leadership of Helsinki's Mayor Jan Vapavuri, well, housing minister, which brought in the country's first uh, housing first approach. They started by getting the 10 biggest cities on board, but the aim was clear, to do away with hostels. What came across to me was the need for joined up working, resources and leadership. We saw firsthand how Housing First has worked in Finland and our committee recommended such an approach here. I think uh, Mr. Vapavuri summed it up well when he said that they changed their mindset. They decided that what people with multiple issues need first of all is a permanent home and then you can tackle the other problems. So Housing First became one of our committee's key recommendations. Uh, and it's good to see the government get behind rapid rehousing and Housing First. I think the idea of having five Housing First Pathfinder cities does make sense. It's following the approach that they took in Finland. But in order to bring about a seed change, in order to make a difference that we'll notice takes more than an action plan, more than consultations, more than phrases like seeking partnerships, developing frameworks, exploring ways to help. In the end, on top of all the other actions outlined in the action plan, we need more houses. We need places for people to live uh, and we'll have to build them. Moving to a rapid rehousing model would mean increasing lets to homeless households by 45% across the social and private rented sectors. If all need was to be met within the social housing sector, 52% of all social lets across Scotland would have to be made to homeless households. Currently, an average of 41% of all council lets and 26% of RSL lets are made to homeless households. Clearly, the target of delivering 50,000 affordable homes in the lifetime of this Parliament will help, but we need to go further. Shelter Scotland's Commission on Housing and Wellbeing have estimated that 150,000 households 
are on the waiting list for a home. They also estimated that 73,000 households are overcrowded. That shows the scale of the problem. The latest homelessness in Scotland statistics show that there were 30, well, nearly 35,000 homelessness applications recorded during 2017-18, 402 more than the previous year. And that's the first increase uh, in nine years. It's a big number. Yes. Sure, Robertson. Does Graeme Simpson think that might have something to do with the rollout of universal credit, given it covers that same period? I know it certainly does in my constituency. Graeme Simpson. I think homelessness is an extremely uh, complex issue, and there's not uh, one reason for it. Uh, there are multiple reasons for it. We all need to accept that. Housing is a human right, but the huge lack of housing has led to people sleeping out on the streets, stuck in pure... Uh, poor quality accommodation or in a cramped hostel room. We must redouble our efforts to address this public scandal. Finally, I want to touch on the issue raised by the Labour Amendment, which we will be supporting. Now, you won't often hear me engage in gender politics. I don't think I've ever done so, in fact, so today may be a first. But Scottish Women's Aid, a right to highlight the need to understand the causes of homelessness among women and children. Domestic abuse is a major cause of women's homelessness in Scotland, but women experiencing domestic abuse remain unprioritised within a list of groups with particular needs. Uh, Presiding officer, thanks to work done in this parliament, I'm just closing, uh, thanks to work done in this parliament across parties, the government is moving in the right direction. It will never be quick enough, but it behoves us all to work together to end the scandal of people sleeping on the streets in hovels without a place to call their own. Thank you very much. And I now call on Pauline McNeill to speak to and move Amendment 14962.3. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the Labour Amendment. Um, the queues of homelessness, the queues of homeless outside winter night shelters have begun in many places. The average temperature in Scotland in December overnight is just above freezing. And in the past year here in Scotland, 94 men and women have died whilst homeless. It's absolutely heartbreaking to us all. This scandal on our streets must end and this action plan must go straight to the heart of this problem. It's no wonder that the average life expectancy of a rough sleeper is aged 43. The isolation, the misery, the cold, the indignity that only we can imagine that rough sleepers have to put up with, with little chance to enforce any right to have a bed for the night. We owe a great debt to organisations like the Glasgow Mission, the Bethany Trust, the Simon Community, the Cyrenians, and many more for being out there and providing shelter where no one else has. But we know homelessness is more than bricks and mortar. The number of homeless applications has gone up for the first time in nine years. And the number of single homeless men is significant, as is the number of young women under the age of 24. There appears to be a change in the pattern of homelessness. And if that's the case, it's important to spot it and to try to understand why that is the case. I too would like to give credit to the local government committee, who I do believe are a driving force in this parliament in making homelessness a real priority for the Scottish government. And we will, of course, support the Scottish government in ending homelessness together. We recognise the work done in the action plan and the many organisations behind it. But I am also proud of Labour's achievements in the last Labour government, which created world-leading homelessness legislation. But I hope there's a recognition by the Scottish government that none of this can be achieved without the recognition of the importance of local government in the delivery of that, and they need the resources to be able to do it, and our amendment addresses that. The findings of the recent oh, Scottish you, Government, I will give way, yes. Um, Kevin Thank you very much, President Officer, uh, and the Government will support Labour's amendment uh, today. Um, I recognise that uh, local government uh, needs that help in hand to transform, to change culture, um, to ensure that we get this right, and that's why we have the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund, uh, and we have already committed large amounts of that to local government to allow them to make the change. Only last week, the commitment to £2 million to deal with rapid rehousing plans and housing first. That will help local government 
help us make that change. So we can only do this in partnership, and I agree with that point. Polly I'm on record as wholeheartedly welcoming these pots of money, which are important. But the central point is this, that the baseline for delivery is local government and their budgets. Local government across the country is struggling, and there must be a recognition by the Scottish Government that going forward that has to be addressed in the budget. The findings of the recent Scottish Government report on health and homelessness came as no surprise. Homelessness and poor health are inextricably linked in the interaction with some services, particularly those related to alcohol, drugs and mental health, increases the lead up to a homelessness application. Those who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless are overrepresented in accident and emergency. And these findings highlight the fact that by the time they are seen by a health professional, homeless people rough sleepers in particular are often at crisis point. It was Hugh Hill, director of operations for the Simon community that pointed out, it's past time public health took an active role in addressing the stark health inequalities and exclusions homeless people have to endure. This group don't just experience health inequalities, they define the term. Despite this, the Health and Homelessness Standards 2005 was the last strategy for the NHS boards in support of planning and provision for services for homeless people. I called for a renewed health strategy today. Mental health, as the action plan highlights, is the most commonly identified support need of a homeless household in Scotland. And in the past year, um, these figures bear that out. It is over double that of the number of households with drug and alcohol dependency but it's also one of the most common reasons that people fail to maintain their tenancies. I have supported the Housing, Force initi the Housing First initiative. I will continue to do so. But as Graham Simpson mentions in his contribution, the scandal of temporary accommodation and the law being broken on a regular basis has to require urgent action by the Scottish Government. Crisis have recently drawn attention uh, to the fact that it's not just the number of people in temporary accommodation, but it's the suitability of that accommodation that needs to be addressed. In the past year, there were 400 placements involving a breach of the unsuitable accommodation order. The scope of the order should be extended, in my opinion, so that no one should expect to be placed in accommodation that is not wind or watertight and does not have cooking facilities. I think I've only got a minute left. I mean, I'm not sure. It's up to the member that we're relatively okay for time this afternoon. I'll take the interview. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, and I thank Ms McNeil for giving way. 86% of temporary accommodation at this moment in time in Scotland is mainstream social housing. Obviously, we want to see that go up, uh, and we will do all that we can to do that. Um, I've already said that we will uh, pledge today uh, to ensure uh, that we move forward in this front. We will bring forward the consultation on temporary accommodation at the beginning of next year, uh, and we will uh, announce in the programme for government, as Mr Simpson asked, uh, about how we legislate for that in future. And I think we would all do well to support that. Pauline McNeill. Okay, uh, you, you said that to Graeme Simpson, and I'm quite happy to support that, and I do welcome it. Um, Domestic abuse is one of the leading causes of homelessness, which creates the necessity to put measures in place to protect women and children fleeing violence. And I agree with Women's Aid and the Chartered Institute of Housing that it's time to review legislation to ensure that survivors and not perpetrators of domestic abuse have a right to stay in their home should they, should, should they choose to do so. I ask the Scottish Government to look at the call for the creation of an emergency fund to help survivors of domestic abuse pay for items such as furniture for a new home. And there must be a stark recognition that there is a gender dimension to homelessness in the action plan. Almost half of people made homeless in Scotland where the cause was rent arrears in the last year lived in the private sector. High rents are a problem in this whole debate Evictions continue to be one of the key reasons um, why, people lose their, uh, why people lose their properties. And that's why we'll be supporting the Green Amendment tonight, because we think we need to deal with high rents in this parliamentary session. I conclude, presiding officer, by emphasising that local government is key to delivering the strategy on homelessness. Without local authorities, this action plan cannot work. Labour wants the Scottish Government to acknowledge in accepting our amendment tonight that we are 
voting to ensure that there are adequate resources to make this transformational change in approach to housing and the rapid rehousing model, which we wholeheartedly support. There must be a longer term plan set in place to build even more affordable homes beyond 2021, whoever the Scottish Government happens to be at that time. Without these commitments, the plan to reform temporary accommodation will not work. We are committed to joining with the Scottish Government and opposition parties to ending hopelessness, homelessness with these provisos. We believe we can do just that. Thank you very much. And I now call on Andy Whiteman to speak to and move Amendment 14962.2. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, Greens welcome this debate. The human right to housing is a key priority uh, for us, as I'm sure it is for all other parties. And homelessness is an appalling condition to have to endure and is a mark of shame on any society. It's one of the basics of human survival, along with food and water provided to some of the most vulnerable in society. I want, first of all, to thank COSLA and the Scottish Government for publishing the High Action, High Level Action Plan and for following the recommendations of the Local Government Communities Committee in adopting a housing first approach. And for Scotland, I want to record to our thanks to the members of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group for their hard work and leadership. Whatever else might be said in this debate, it's clear there's a strong cross-party consensus to ending homelessness. And minister, the Minister can be sure of our ongoing support and principle for his efforts uh, in this area. Now, in my short time this afternoon, I want to focus on some missing pieces of the jigsaw in relation to the key drivers for homelessness. Part two of the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan sets out measures to prevent homelessness happening in the first place and contains a summary of the reasons for homelessness. Actions by the landlord and being asked to leave account for 36% of homelessness applications. A violent or abusive dispute within the household accounts for 13%, with domestic violence also being cited amongst the 22% of other reasons. So preventing homelessness is about upholding the human right to housing, ensuring that people have legal security of tenure and that housing is affordable and habitable. Those are human rights. And since 1999, the number of tenants living in the private rented sector has tripled. And that is because most tenants in this sector have got no choice but to live in this most precarious and insecure type of housing. And I'm sure many members will be aware from constituency casework of individuals and young families being pushed into the hands of homelessness services simply because they can't afford rising rents. Here in Edinburgh, the average rent for a two-bedroom property is currently £1,033 per month. This week, the Scottish Government released figures for the private rented sector in Scotland from 2010 to 18. And in Lothian, average rents have increased above the rate of inflation for all property types. That means that one bedroom and two bedroom properties now cost tenants between 40 and 42% more to rent than they did eight years ago. And bearing in mind that the UK consumer, pre consumer price index has risen by 18.7% this period, it's evident that the cost of housing is rising significantly above the price of goods and services. Happy to do so. Mike Crumbles. Thank you, Deputy Presiding. I'm concerned about the unintended consequences of Andy Whiteman's amendment um, about the worry about taking accommodation out of the market altogether. As the, to give you an example, the unintentional landlords, individuals who maybe they've got their flat or house in negative equity and need, need to move to another part of the country, they would let their flat out. If they can't get access to that flat, or that accommodation, there is a danger that they won't put it on the market in the first place. So the unintended consequences of his amendment. Andy Whiteman. For a review, and I'll come to the very specific point the member uh, was talking about. I mean, I just, I think we just disagree. I don't think that somebody's home should be taken from them because the owner wishes to sell it. I just don't agree with that. Um, and it is not just rent levels. Coming to the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act, it came into force, replacing nearly three decades of the short assured Tenancies. And one of the key provisions of this Act was the removal of the no-fault grounds for repossession. Uh, we welcome that. But the Act also included 18 statutory grounds contained in Schedule 3 of the Act. So consider this. A couple of years ago, I was advising constituents who live in Lawrence Street in Leith. They had been served with notices to quit because the landlord, the Agnes Hunter Trust, decided to sell their homes. Over 200 people faced being made homeless. A campaign ensued and their properties have now been taken over by a housing association. But one might think that this kind of large-scale eviction will not be able to happen in future, but it can. Under the first ground in Schedule 3, tenants can continue to be evicted because the landlord intends to sell the property. 
Or consider this, last year during the Local Government and Communities Committee's inquiry into homelessness, as Graham Simpson mentioned, we hosted a session with a range of people who had experienced homelessness, including young care experienced people. It was a very moving and extremely informative session. One story sticks in my mind. Thomas, who sat next to me in the committee room, was a private rented sector tenant. He was made homeless because his landlord went bankrupt and the creditor seized his property. If he was a tenant facing similar circumstances in Denmark, Germany, Portugal, he would remain in his home. But here in Scotland, he was thrown onto the streets and a decade long cycle of trauma, rough sleeping and temporary accommodation. Had our modern tenancy legislation been in place, one might have think it would have protected Thomas, but it won't. Under the second ground in Schedule 3, tenants can continue to be evicted because the property has been taken over by a creditor who wishes to sell with vacant possession. Or consider this, I've been campaigning for over a year now to better regulate the rapidly growing short-term let sector. A staggering number of dwellings have been converted to short-term lets as landlords seek to maximise revenues. And as John Harris today writes in The Guardian, in too many cities, families live in temporary accommodation whilst tourists live in homes. Constituents have contacted me after being served with notice to quit because the landlord wants to operate short-term lets. Again, one might think that a new private residential tenancy regime would protect a tenant against eviction, but it won't. Under the sixth ground in Schedule 3, tenants can continue to be evicted where the landlord wishes to use the property for a purpose other than providing someone with a home. So that's the reason why we've tabled an amendment tonight to review the statutory grounds for repossession. I commend Pauline McNeil for highlighting the other important driver of homelessness that I indicated in relation to domestic violence and the gendered nature of homelessness. Earlier this year, I met Joe Osaka from Scottish Women's Aid and Callum Homechuck from the Chartered Institute to discuss it. I welcome the wide recognition, in fact, that this topic has engendered amongst the uh, people who provided briefings to this debate. So to conclude, Presiding Officer, Scotland can and should be a world leader in preventing homelessness, but that can only be achieved if we have an effective legislative base that ensures everyone has a safe, warm place. Therefore, we are calling on the Scottish Government to review the current private rented sector law. I look forward to working with the Government if they agree, and I move the amendment in my name. My name. Alex Cole-Hamilton, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by referring members to my register of interest? I jointly own a flat uh, for which the tenants receive housing benefit. It's a relationship that's existed between myself and the tenants for 10 years. And in that time, I've come to know a lot of the housing benefit infrastructure and indeed many of the traps that exist and actually supported them through several periods where they uh, narrowly avoided homelessness and I, I'm very glad to, to call them my friends. Um, Shelter provided us with an excellent briefing uh, in advance of this afternoon's debate. Every 18 minutes uh, somebody reports as homeless. So all told that's 30,000 households in Scotland, Deputy Presiding Officer, and, and from my background the tragedy of that is in the 15,000 children to whom that also applies. We all see that in our surgeries in, uh, in Edinburgh and in, in other parts of the country where homelessness is a real problem and, and, and I can only speak to my experience of Edinburgh's housing shortage but the experience of my constituents battling every Friday bidding for houses on Ed Index and coming sometimes 40th despite having silver or even gold priority status having had that status for up to and over a year is just astonishing and shocking um, there's a, a great deal of churn in terms of the housing offices to which they are attached um, and indeed whilst there is a, some no shortage of empathy from a lot of those housing offices there is dispassion as well and indeed a, a heavy bureaucracy when they find themselves in that situation they often find themselves in temporary or emergency accommodation and uh, to a substandard in many cases which is uh, often experiencing overcrowding, inappropriate family sharing, and indeed protracted amounts of time. And in many of these cases, it's those cases which fail to recognize the very specific needs of these families, particularly around disability, or additional uh, support needs, particularly around children with autism, that I find the system very uh, dispassionate. But also, and I'm grateful for the amendments today which reference domestic violence, because I think we should treat very differently those women who are fleeing, fleeing abusive spousal relationships, uh, for whom housing is often used as a tool of coercive control in that abusive relationship. We've heard a lot also about the business end of homelessness in Scotland, and that is, of course, rough sleeping. It's a very different proposition in Scotland. You only need to look out of the window today and see what a lethal quality Scotland's weather has. And, and Pauline McNeill is absolutely right to reference the 94 lives lost to us as a result of rough sleeping. That is a Dickensian statistic in 2018. 
what links all of these cases is trauma. And trauma is both causal and a resultant from homelessness. Look at those, you only need to look at the groups of people for whom uh, homelessness is most prevalent, whether that's in our, those leaving, being liberated from our prisons, in Scottish veterans, those young people of care experience, and indeed abuse, abuse survivors. I had a, a young veteran come to see me uh, last week. He had been thrown out of his temporary accommodation because of a violent outburst. But that violent outburst was resultant from diagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder that he obtained as his, from his time in conflict. Happily, I was able to connect him with a veterans charity, which are, are providing him accommodation. But for five nights, he had to sleep on a church hall floor. And, and there is something fundamentally broken in our system. Happily to Kes. Kes here, Duckdale. A few homeless people in this city who would sooner sleep rough than live in some of the high-rise flats in the members' constituency. I wonder if he would comment on some of the properties in Muir House and what he would say to the government about what's needed to bring them up to standard. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the member for the intervention. I was coming on to Muir House because I recently toured uh, one of the high-rise tenements in uh, Muir House in my constituency, and it is frankly appalling. I left with a rasp in my throat and tears in my eyes from the, the mould, the black mould that a young mother and her child are forced to endure. We are working with Edinburgh City Council. My colleagues in Edinburgh City Council took a motion to the council to have an urgent review of the housing stock that we provide uh, people in Muir House, to which, the, uh, which was rebuffed by the city's administration. We are persevering in that uh, regard. But there is a comorbidity of need as well that, that comes with homelessness. Homelessness is not just something that happens in isolation. 47% of people have underlying health or mental health problems. They're, it's linked to addiction and other forms of uh, social um, poor outcomes. But for young people in particular, I spent some time working in the children's sector, as you know, and we had in Abolara, Scotland's only refuge for young runaways. One in nine young people will run away at some point in their lives uh, from home, by which I mean being absent without knowledge of where they are for 24 hours or most. Most are sofa surfing, some are sleeping rough. One quarter of all of them will experience some form of abuse, whether that's physical, sexual, or financial abuse while they're running. It is a terrible statistic and one we've still not fully addressed. I want to say a word about stigma as well, because with homelessness and not having this, the confidence and security of a stable home of your own comes stigma. George Orwell, in his book, uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, described stigma when he said, dirt is a great respecter of persons. It lets you alone when you are well dressed, but as soon as your color is gone, it flies towards you from all directions. With that stigma become, comes mental ill health, feelings of a lack of self-worth, and, and that compounds all of the problems associated with homelessness. And just getting your feet back under him. We all of us have a duty here to consider our fellow Scots who tonight and many other nights from now will face this winter in danger and in the dark, not just on the icy streets of our towns and our cities, but in the housing departments and the offices where people have to present every day to find out what emergency accommodation may be available to them. So I am grateful to the Scottish Government for the work it is doing in, the, in this area. We strip out our partisan viewpoints here because we have to come together to resolve this issue. It is much bigger than any one of us or any party in this chamber and I thank them for their efforts in that regard. Thank you. We move to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes please. Uh, Gillian Martin followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Presiding Officer, in my constituency of Aberdeenshire East, homelessness may not have been considered obvious affluent part of the country after all. Uh, in some ways the North East though is a tale of two cities, uh, if I could, um, where there is much wealth but there's also pockets of insidious rural poverty. The long term trend across Scotland has shown a decrease in applications since 2008 and I commend the hard work of efforts in the Scottish Government to tackle this issue and make it a priority because no one should have to live in the streets and we should all have the right to safe warm accommodation a place we call home. But unfortunately, recently Aberdeenshire has seen a rise in applications, um, despite the, over long, uh, the overall long-term decline in applications. In my constituency, the rollout of universal credit began just last month, so it's too early to tell what, impact this policy, what the impact of this policy will be. But given the devastating impact the policy has already had in other parts of the country, and, and listen to what Shona Robertson has just said about Dundee, it's fair to say I am worried. Uh, other areas that had an earlier rollout have seen an increase in rent arrears, and as we know, that can often lead to homelessness. 
So there are many reasons why someone may end up facing homelessness and we know from figures released by Shelter that single men are most at risk, followed by single parent females. And who would have thought that 52 years after Ken Loach's Cathy Come Home film took the issue into the living rooms of the nation and shocked the nation that we'd still be battling the causes of homelessness? Factors can range from domestic abuse, release from prison, relationship breakdowns, family conflict and financial issues and debt. And I recently had a case uh, with a woman and her children in veterans accommodation in Inverurie were in real danger of being made homeless because her ex-army husband left the family home to pursue an extramarital relationship. And it was his service which entitled the family to their house, the house that they had lived in for years. Uh, in Aberdeenshire, there's a dedicated team of housing officers who assess and provide low-level housing support to assist in better tenancy, sustainment and prevention of homelessness. And I want to put on record my thanks to Aberdeenshire Council and that department for their quick response and the way that they worked together with the Scottish Veterans Garden City Association who owned that housing to ensure that not only did they have a new home to go to, but the Veterans Association extended the, the leaving date to allow them not to have a period when they had to go into a temporary accommodation. I thank them both very much for that. Last year, a total of 1,270 referrals were made into housing for support in Aberdeenshire. And the number of applications under the homeless persons legislation has risen in Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire in the past year. Um, but, but one of the critical issues for housing support staff is ensuring that adequate support is given to those with complex needs. And it's essential that services continue to work together to achieve better outcomes and meet the needs of these individuals. And one of the ways in which it's been met th is through the Pit Stop Service, which is run by Turning Point Scotland and Aberdeenshire. And this service provides 24-hour support within temporary accommodation to single people with substance misuse issues and who are homeless or at the risk of be becoming homeless. Um, the service aims to equip residents with the tools to live independently by helping them gain the life, uh, life skills, confidence and resilience needed to live independently. And in Aberdeenshire, supported accommodation is also operated within a facility for six young people with support needs as well as commissioning places of supported accommodation specifically for young people. I have um, a sort of second-hand experience of that as, as, a, as a friend of mine um, who actually was leaving foster care. He was in foster care quite quite late on. Um, the family moved and he didn't want to move um, but he didn't really have the life skills to equip him and they were worried about him being homeless. We were all worried about him being homeless. He's had quite a traumatic childhood and he's, he's now working as a chef because there was that partnership relationship. It wasn't just about the home, it was about the fact they get, wanted to get him into education and get him uh, uh, the skills to, to work. Um, we, we know that in Aberdeenshire, one of the other challenges faced is that people who might have lived their entire life in that part of the northeast, they want to be rehomed in that area. And it's not always possible. And often the only available housing is elsewhere, for example, in the city. Um, or, and, and they might refuse that, or if they accept that, it can lead to isolation as people are taken away from their communities and the relationships that they have locally. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the development of the affordable homes for rent, some of which I've visited with the Minister, will mean that this is less of a, of a, of a situation that happens so, so often and that people can actually stay where they're free. Uh, over the last three years, um, I've also had constituents coming to me worried about making the next mortgage payment after being let go from their oil and gas job with no notice. Um, they'll be in at their desk at 8am on a Friday and out in the car park with their belongings and no job by 8.20. Or told they have no job over the phone, like my friend Neil, who worked for the same production company for over 30 years. Um, and it the phone call happened to happen on his 50th birthday to add insult to injury. Or the chap that came in to me for help from me who had to access food banks to feed himself after a year without pay following years as an offshore medic. Or the family last year who gave a whole trolley of shopping in last year's collection for the Inverurie Food Bank because they told me because the year before they had been in temporary accommodation and they'd had to access food banks themselves. They both lost their jobs at the same time and now they were back on their feet. And I've asked the Oil and Gas Authority for a commitment that they look into employment practices of their members uh, as this just can't stand in, in the future. We can't have this situation again. It's important to remind ourselves that the better need for services comes as pressures on food banks increase and the number of people struggling with rent arrears or mortgage arrears is on the rise. And as often mentioned in this chamber, we all could be two packets, pay packets away from destitution. And those working in precarious employment live on that knife edge every day. 
So the Scottish Government is clearly committed to ending homelessness and rough sleeping for good, but we must also tackle its source, the other causes for homelessness, for which the Scottish Government does not have the power, like employment law, pensions and employment benefit support. We miss out that part of the equation, and Cathy Come Home will always be as relevant today as it was in the 1960s. Presiding Officer. So before we move on, I think there are a couple of members who have said that they intend to speak who haven't pressed the request to speak buttons. If you could check, please. Thank you, Ms Robson. <laughs> and we now have Oliver Mundell to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this important debate today. As other speakers have already said, how we help those most in need is a measure of our society's values. And when it comes to ending homelessness, I believe the people of Scotland are watching and looking to us all to work together to end this crisis. In what is a rich and developed country, there is absolutely no excuse for not tackling homelessness. It is an avoidable uh, scourge on our society. And while it is possible to find the finger of blame here, there and everywhere, um, it doesn't move the situation forward. We all know what needs to be done and there are some encouraging early signs of progress but we do need to move uh, faster uh, because every day of delay in action uh, and every day uh, where the right support is not in place is another day lost for individuals and families who face the huge challenge that not having uh, shelter or suitable accommodation brings. That can't be tolerated and it, it can't be accepted. I know from my own constituency mailbag and from surgeries how challenging this issue is it's often easy to think of homelessness as something that happens in big cities and in urban areas. However, there is a huge problem with what many term hidden homelessness in rural communities. There are many families living in unsuitable uh, accommodation, temporary accommodation, uh, couch surfing. Uh, and I have to say very sadly, I've even heard of individuals asking to bunk down in agricultural buildings for want of somewhere uh, warm and safe to stay. It's not good enough, um, and I remain very concerned uh, by families living long-term in B&B accommodation without access to things like washing machines uh, or facilities to cook hot meals, and ultimately uh, they feel uh, very little security, um, even though I do accept that you know, in uh, crisis situations it's better uh, than, than nothing, but it, it, re it really falls short um, of, of what's acceptable. Um, and I think that more needs to be done to improve the quality um, of housing stock and I've written uh, to the Minister uh, many times about that because I think there are a number um, of uh, housing associations uh, who, who don't uh, live up to the high standards uh, that we expect of them and they don't always uh, deliver. Yep. Kevin Stewart. Design officer. Um, I, I know that uh, Mr Mundell, Mundell has written to me uh, on a, a number of occasions and I would appreciate uh, any member who has a concern around about the suitability of uh, social housing, whether that be council uh, or housing association, uh, to, to let us know. I would urge members to look at um, the discussion around about beyond 2021. I think it's important for all of us uh, to get housing associations, councils, ourselves and individuals uh, to give us their vision of what they want to see uh, beyond this current parliament. And I think it's incumbent on all of us uh, to listen to those views. Oliver Mundell. You know, I, I very much uh, support that approach and, and I do welcome uh, the Minister's personal help and intervention in a number of cases. I, I know how much uh, focus he puts into uh, some of these issues. Um, I also uh, would say as well, for me, part of the picture is about ensuring that people uh, know their housing rights. I think there are a lot of people uh, living in, in uh, social housing who, who don't understand uh, the responsibilities that are on uh, their landlords. And I think there's more uh, we can do to support that. And that in part, uh, along with the other issues I've just mentioned, is why I was so pleased uh, to see representatives of Shelter Scotland uh, in Dumfries High Street a few weeks ago, um, highlighting uh, the important work and support they and many in the uh, third sector uh, provide in, in that respect. Um, but uh, on, on, on top of these issues, um, I'm also very concerned about the number of people sleeping rough. I remember during my own time uh, here in Edinburgh as a student uh, helping out in the grass market soup kitchen. Um, we're now a number of years on and that facility uh, has had a makeover, but we're still no closer to solving 
uh, the problem. And I find it very sad personally, uh, driving home from the parliament uh, past the Salvation Army hostel, you know, just a matter of meters away, uh, regularly seeing people queue up uh, to secure a room for the night. And I think it's something that we can't uh, just ignore. Um, and they're one of a number of charities um, who are carrying the burden uh, for our collective failure to put the most basic rights in place uh, for our citizens. Um, and whilst uh, I agree uh, with our front bench and party policy that housing supply is very important, uh, and I do fully support the Housing First um, initiative, um, I think it's a, for me some of the questions are about more than uh, capacity um, and, and more than housing and making sure that people uh, have the support in place to help them uh, really identify uh, identify housing because I think uh, for a number of people who are in crisis who are going back to uh, homeless shelters uh, night after night uh, they, they have some very immediate issues uh, that need addressed um, so I mean I very much welcome uh, the the approach that's been taken today and uh, the uh, reassurances from the government that they're going to act uh, on some of the priorities uh, we've outlined um, and we on these benches and uh, personally I uh, stand ready not just uh, to try and hold the government to account but also to support the very considerable efforts and early actions that are underway. Thank you. Emma Harper followed by Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this afternoon's debate ending homelessness together and I welcome the new measures announced by the Scottish Government to help eradicate the human rights issue of homelessness. Everyone in Scotland, regardless of their race, religion, background, gender and social circumstance, absolutely must have a safe, warm and settled place that they call home. Indeed, anyone made homeless is legally entitled to housing and I'm glad to hear that there is cross-party consensus across the Chamber this afternoon that we are going to tackle homelessness together. Although I do recognise that more work has to be done to ensure that all who are presented as homeless are housed at the earliest possible time. So this is a, a key issue that we need to pursue. Presiding officer, last week I attended a meeting in my South Scotland region with Dumfries and Galloway Council's financial wellbeing and revenues manager. And I was told by her that in 2017 and 18, 834 homeless applications were received by DNG Council and 76.7% .7 were from single person with no children households. 18% of the applications had children in the households though. And nationally, we have seen a 9% rise in the number of children in temporary accommodation, and this is concerning. 29.5% of the DNG applications were from people with mental health needs. And 6%, which is 50 people, they said that they had slept rough the night before their application was submitted. It is also worth noting that currently the law requires local authorities to take a homeless application for someone who is at immediate threat of homelessness within the next three months. This means that not all cases where an application is taken will need emergency or temporary accommodation, such as in a B&B. &B. And as a B&B &B owner myself, where my husband runs our business currently, we have had um, people show up at 12 o'clock at night People like young men, young women, uh, families and young children. Um, and you can see the stress or the anxiety on their faces as they are showing up at midnight. So B&B &B isn't ideal. The accommodation is variable and Graeme Simpson has <laughs> rightly highlighted that there are issues such as curfews or visiting by families and other restrictions. But I've let the Chamber know there were no curfews or restrictions and even access to washing machines and kitchen was available in our B&B. So, um, as a stock transfer authority, Dumfries and Galloway Council rely on registered social landlords to find permanent accommodation for those who present as homeless. And this means it can be quite challenging. So I'm pleased that the government has engaged in the house building of uh, affordable housing with over 78,000 affordable homes built since the SNP came to power. And furthermore, the government is helping to assist local authorities across Scotland, including Dumfries and Galloway and South Ayrshire Council in my South Scotland region, by investing more than £3 billion to deliver an additional minimum of 35,000 homes. 
This will better allow local authorities to house those presented as homeless as soon as possible and will reduce the need for temporary B&B accommodation. I'd like to briefly highlight some of the work of Lorburn Housing in my region. Like many housing associations, the last thing Lorburn wants is to make someone homeless. So as an organisation, they focus on the customer at the heart of allocations and tenancy management. Lorburn ensures that properties are allocated appropriately for both the incoming customer and customers who are already housed at a development. They do not want to set people up to fail, so they will consider people's circumstances and any issues before allocating a property. Lorburn assists people with a wide range of support measures, some of which include getting furniture, carpets or white goods for the property through the person's own initiative or through the Scottish Government's Scottish Welfare Fund. And through the new Great Start initiative in partnership with Shacks in Dumfries, Lorburn provides customers with a voucher to spend on items for the property. This supports the customer as well as other local char charities. They assist with starting, changing and maintaining a universal credit claim. And like my colleagues Gillian Martin and uh, Shona Robinson have mentioned, my casework in my office also echoes the challenges of universal credit and how it has led to some people becoming homeless. The, the Lorburn Housing has been extremely helpful in my casework and supporting me with liaising and challenging for people who, who are having real difficulty with making their rent and uh, allowing the forgiving of rent arrears. So all of the challenges that we see that our local authorities and our Lorburn Housing is doing, we need to make sure that other authorities will take the lead from that. So. I'd like to quickly give recognition to Bethany Christian Trust also because they carry out important work in supporting people affected by homelessness. I welcome the Scottish Government's £50 million investment in Ending Homelessness Together Fund, which aims to put an end to rough sleeping whilst funding homelessness prevention initiatives. £23.5 million has already been allocated from the Ending Homelessness Fund and from the Health Portfolio for Rapid Rehousing First. I'd like to welcome the positive work which has been proposed and indeed already carried out by the Scottish Government and other third sector bodies. And I congratulate organisations across my South Scotland region and I agree that we all must work together to end homelessness. Thank you. Kezia Dugdale, followed by Shona Robson. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the chance to speak in this debate. It's a laudable report, there's no doubt about that, and the recommendations within it are admirable. But based on what I see in this city, much of it, and I have to say this to the Cabinet Secretary and to the Minister, is utterly fanciful. And I want to talk today very specifically about the real experience of my constituents in this city who are homeless right now. One of them came to my constituency surgery back in April. He was living in temporary accommodation with his baby. He's a recovering addict. He's been clean for nine years. He has custody of his child because the child's mother still has addictions. He's been living in this hostel for two months before he came to see me at my constituency surgery. And he only came to my surgery because he's had no hot water for three days. And the one microwave that he shared with 89 other residents in that hostel was broken. Imagine trying to feed a baby with no hot water and one microwave between 90 residents in this city in 2018. That is happening now. The room was filthy, the bed was infested with mites. When my office checked with him this morning to ask if it was okay that I could share his experiences with the chamber, he asked me to tell you that he'd slept in cleaner crack in heroin dens than he had hostels and B&Bs in this city. I got him out of that hostel and into a flat in Loch End, a private rented sector flat, one that he can barely afford. And that's somehow considered a success story, that he's no longer in that temporary hostel. He's in a flat that he'll no longer be able to afford in two or three months' time. I thought his story was a one-off. Until I read the Ferret report this week, which told us about the situation in Edinburgh, that 600 families had been in temporary hostels or B&B accommodation in the past year, 466 of them for more than a week. My constituent with that baby was in a hostel for two months. They were breaking the law 466 times in that last year. But when you look at the detail of the law, 
they weren't actually breaking it because there's an exemption. And the exemption is you can be placed in that accommodation if there's nothing else suitable. And there isn't anything else suitable in this city. We are so far short of having the accommodation we need for so many families like him. So I hope the Cabinet Secretary can see just how angry I am at the idea that we have to wait until 2023 to get better standards for temporary accommodation in this city. I could write those standards right now. A clean room, a kettle in the room, access to kitchen facilities for six people or less. Why does it have to take five years to have a set of minimum standards for people like that? I've got another constituent who's been sleeping rough for several weeks now. The council wouldn't give him a place in a hostel because they said he had a tenancy, that he was intentionally homeless. He did have a flat, but the last time he was in that flat, he was beaten within an inch of his life and he cannot go back there. I've never met this constituent. I've received all this information from a member of the public who cared enough to sit down on the street and ask him why he was sleeping there that night. That person then advocated on his behalf to me at my surgery. She sent me flowers yesterday because I'd managed to get that person into a new settled flat. I should be thanking her for speaking up on his behalf, for advocating for him when he had no voice. And let's talk about advocates for a second. Before I got elected, I was an advocate for four people in this city with multiple and complex needs. I was their advocate because their support packages were being cut. I spent years trying to convince Edinburgh City Council that if they took away their care hours, these people relied on that care support to hold down their tenancy, they were gonna end up back in the police cell, back in the justice system, or in an A and E ward. This week, I found out that two of those four people are now dead. I found that out from the local Unite branch of care workers here in this city, who've just done an FOI into the number of people who are reliant on care packages in the city and still don't have it. They told me that the people in Edinburgh right now who receive a care package, there are 6,906 unmet hours. That support that they've been told that they need, that they can't get because there aren't enough care workers. There are a further 850 people in this city who've been identified as needing a care package who are currently waiting for one. It hasn't even started yet. And there are hundreds and hundreds more people waiting to be assessed for a package that they can only dream of ever receiving. So yes, Minister, that report is laudable, but there is nowhere near enough resource to back it up. We have a housing crisis in this city. We have a social care crisis in this city. And every time you cut council budgets, you make it worse. Just yesterday, Universal Credit rolled out into Edinburgh. That is going to compound the problems that already exist. And I'm angry at the Tories for that. Of course I am, and I will fight that to the bitter end. But they are not solely responsible for it. I'm talking to you about eight years worth of experience I have in this city of supporting homeless people at the state of temporary accommodation that my council taxes pay for to keep landlords rich and the poorest people in the most destitute situations. Please don't make me, five, make me wait five years before we improve that temporary accommodation. In your summing up speeches tonight, please tell me you'll do something before 2023 about that, at the very least. Shona Robson, followed by Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to take part in this debate. And I want to begin by acknowledging the work of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group uh, in developing a, a report informed by evidence and experiences from across Scotland on how we can continue moving forward to stop homelessness and ensure appropriate housing uh, for all. Based on the recommendations in that report, the Scottish Government has put together a, a strong response, in my view, in the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan. I look forward to seeing that plan implemented by the Scottish Government and reviewing the evaluation done by the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group to ensure these plans stay on track. Over the last 10 years, the Scottish Government has demonstrated a commitment to ending homelessness with over 78,000 affordable homes made available, more than £3 billion committed to help reach the target of 50,000 new affordable homes by 2021. And of course, £50 million going to the Ending Homelessness Together Fund. Now, over the long term, 
We are seeing a reduction in homelessness applications, which is a good thing, but we are all aware that we have to work hard to continue that trend. Now, uh, Graham Simpson earlier in his contribution said, talked about his concern about the rise in homelessness over the last year. You know, but surely he must acknowledge that this has not been assisted in any way by the UK government welfare policies, which I think is responsible for last year's small rise in homelessness applications. He has to acknowledge that many Scots have been hard hit by universal credit with benefit cuts, sanctions, long waiting periods, all make it hard for people to get by, putting pressure on many to balance housing costs with other necessities, especially in the five week period before they receive universal credit. Many people are forced into debt and relying on food banks. In Dundee, my constituents on universal credit owe an average of £200 in rent arrears more than those on other benefits, which will have a direct impact on homelessness. So I agree when Graham Simpson says that tackling homelessness is complex, but accepting that universal credit is a contributing factor is actually quite a simple thing. And I think it would do Graham Simpson and others on the Tory benches good to at least acknowledge that in their contributions. And it's no wonder, uh, as I understand, uh, that at job centres, people are being told to look everywhere and ask everyone they can to find loans before they receive help when their budgets are tight. This year alone, as we know, the Scottish Government will spend £125 million to mitigate the effects of benefit cuts from the UK Government. And these, of course, are resources coming from other budgets. Now, like many in this chamber, I've called for the UK Government to halt the, the rollout of universal credit before we see people on working tax credits put into this already failing system. And, of course, I would like to see welfare powers devolved here. But, you know, we have to listen uh, to the overwhelming evidence that this failed system is pushing people out of their homes, into the houses of friends, into hostels or onto the streets. One of the biggest issues affecting women on universal credit is the lack of split payments. I know the Scottish Government is planning on pursuing split payments as part of a Scottish option and I look forward to participating in the Scottish Government's consultation on how to implement split payments. But right now, the UK government is responsible for split payments. For those in abusive relationships, sending all of their benefits, including their housing benefits, to one bank account can facilitate financial abuse. The UK government has touted split payments in special circumstances as a viable alternative which could be implemented if someone is in an abusive relationship. However, new DWP statistics show us that not a single person in Scotland has received split payments. At the same time, domestic violence was the biggest reason that women gave for making a housing application in Scotland. Presiding officer, this is a disgrace. Yes, of course. Oliver Mundell. I thank the member for giving way, but does she not recognise there's work that could be done right now to make sure that those who experience domestic violence receive priority treatment when it comes to the allocation uh, of housing and support? Well, of, Shona course, Robinson. of course those uh, affected by domestic violence should, she, should uh, receive priority treatment. But surely the member cannot get away from the fact that a policy from his government is exacerbating the situation for women in that position. So he should join with us in making sure that that is tackled. That is something the UK government could do now. And I would, re I would say again that if he's serious about this issue, then he should join with those of us who want to see that addressed. Universal credit is harming women who are in that position, and he would do well to acknowledge that. As we move forward to prevent and stop homelessness, we have to uh, address the issue with the understanding that everyone's experience of homelessness is different, and that already vulnerable people are more prone to homelessness and need uh, targeted support. And I want to pay tribute to Scottish Women's Aid and the work that they uh, have done. Also in Dundee and across Scotland, I know that third sector organisations have been essential supports to people facing homelessness. Shelter Scotland is turning 50 this year and I recently met with them in Dundee to discuss issues still remaining on their 50th anniversary. By providing advice and support, they help thousands of people across Scotland every year. And I think that um, really demonstrates 
how uh, those organisations in the third sector have contributed to fight uh, in the fight to stop homelessness. But I know their hope is that eventually there will be no reason for them to have to continue to fight homelessness because it will no longer be an issue, and I hope so too. What the, Scot the Scottish Government has set out is a plan that will help towards that goal. There is more to be done by acknowledging and planning uh, to address problems we can start uh, to work towards that better future where everyone has a safe, affordable home. Alexander Stewart, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is a, a vitally important debate today, as many contributions already have uh, given their uh, background and their knowledge and their skill base as to how it is affecting their constituents and their regions. People become homeless for many different reasons, and we've heard that today. Some people leave because they are forced out of their home. Others may have a dispute circumstance taking place. Uh, others are seeking uh, refuge because they are fleeing from domestic violence. But what is apparent is that they, they are no longer able to live in that safe and, and, and environment home that they have. While homeless people are drawn from a wide range of backgrounds, it's important to note that, not, that under half sight that they have support needs. Uh, and we can see that some individuals have mental health problems, some have learning disabilities, uh, and some have drug and alcohol dependency. They are in a complex situation. Some people say that they are in crisis and they live in uh, an environment that creates uh, situations and circumstances out with their own control. Uh, and the Local Government Committee uh, saw that very much when we were going through the report. We had the opportunity to meet with some of these individuals uh, and they were very frank uh, and they were very honest about why they got into the situation they did uh, and they were looking for support and help. And I have to pay tribute to the organisations and charities who are doing that immense work on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that they get that support they need. Uh, and as I say, government has a role to play, but without these charities, many more of these individuals would fall through the net. We are therefore here today to look at and talk about the, the, the personalised uh, and the person-centred approach, which I think is the right way to tackle homelessness. It's important that we look at each individual. Indeed, it's one of the key elements that the Scottish Government's talking about when it's in talking about its homeless strategy uh, and, and how it wants to ensure that ending homelessness together. And I'm a, I, I'm, a, I'm a real advocate of that. I think that's exactly what we need to do. But we've already heard from people that more needs to be done. As was already mentioned, uh, as I say, the committee have sat uh, and, and I commend the report that we put forward uh, uh, from, from the committee. It gave us an opportunity to see firsthand what was going on and, as I say, that report uh, then gives us an opportunity to build on it. In fact, the themes from that basis approach are very much uh, what we're looking at. And I can reflect and go back to my time as a councillor on Perth and Kinross Council uh, when we introduced the Home First uh, initiative, and that was back in 2015, which was part of our transfer strategy. We looked at the programme uh, uh, to ensure that, uh, that we ensured that direct route for homeless people into settled accommodation, reducing the need for temporary accommodation. And that was a real success and continues to be a success uh, because it's been seen uh, as, as challenging and tackling and making a difference. Uh, there are many benefits from this approach. Uh, it minimises the length, it minimises the effect and it minimises the stigma as well as uh, the financial impact on homelessness while the, at the same time it delivers better outcomes for individuals and that's what we should be looking at, delivering the outcomes for individuals. The results of this are quite staggering uh, and the Scottish Government have seen uh, that that is the case and charities have also taken that on board. I can look at uh, statistics from my own patch, uh, the length of individuals who, who, who are waiting in temporary accommodation. Some people 132 days. Uh, now that has dropped uh, in Perth and Kinross, now down to under 80 days. Now that's still not a good situation, uh, Dr. Brazil was, but it has at least improved and it continues to improve. And when we look at the weight for people presenting themselves who were offered accommodation uh, uh, has dropped dramatically. People are waiting 441 days to get accommodation. Now that Unbelievably, uh, uh, what kind of situation, circumstance? We've already heard from uh, members this afternoon about families and young people uh, and individuals and, and children. How can they sit in that situation? That has reduced down to 90 days. But as I say, once again, there's still a long way to go. 
I very much welcome the fact uh, that, that there's to be a rapid rehousing transformation plan. That is the right way to go. The guidance and the development of these plans very much builds on the principles that we want to see uh, and that are successful. And I saw in person in Kinross in the Home First model. We in the Scottish Conservatives see reducing the amount of time that homeless individuals spend in temporary accommodation as a major priority uh, and as a measure that requires to be tackled. While the role of authorities is crucial, we also have to talk about housing supply. Uh, you know, there, there, there is a, a lot to be talked about when we, when we look at uh, the, the pledges that individuals and organisations have, and also what the government uh, put forward in manifestos when they talked about building uh, new uh, social rented homes. Uh, that's a laudable, but it wasn't achieved uh, under the, the 2011 manifesto. They talked about 30,000 and only 22 were built. And if we continue as we are at the moment, there'll be 10,000 short of the 50,000 in the current manifesto. So our work requires to be managed and work requires to be done. The Ending the Homeless Together plan, it's right. You know, it talks about in the report one of the most powerful tools of providing uh, and preventing homelessness across our population is to ensure a strong supply of affordable housing. That is one of the main cruxes that we need to ensure we have and the Scottish Government require to do that and to do more and what we have seen uh, Deputy Presiding Officer is the right direction so I conclude in saying that you know it's it's heartening to see this broad cross uh, consensus across the chamber today when we're talking about homelessness because we've all seen it we've all identified it and we in the Scottish Conservatives will play our part to ensure that Scottish Government is both accountable but also has the opportunity to progress because that's the right way to tackle it. We, we welcome the plan because that plan gives opportunity, that plan gives support and that plan gives a, a real link uh, to what is actually taking place but we still have a long way to go Deputy Presiding Officer and I hope that today we can start that journey in a much stronger vein. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Jackie Bailey. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to participate in this debate and welcome the Government's Action Plan. And I want to share the perspective I gained during the Local Government and Communities Committee's year-long inquiry into the causes of and long-term solutions to homelessness in Scotland. Since 2007, we have made significant strides towards eliminating homelessness in Scotland, with the number of people assessed as homeless falling by 6,690 between 2007-8 and 17-18. That's thanks to a proactive approach to housing undertaken by this government, which included ending the right to buy, uh, delivering over 78,000 affordable homes, and in this parliamentary term alone, investing more than £3 billion to deliver at least 50,000 new homes, including 35,000 for social rent. Yet we know that homelessness assessments offer only a narrow perspective of reality for many Scottish families, and this measure does not illustrate the extent to which people are living in temporary, inadequate or precarious housing. We also know that an adequate supply of housing alone cannot solve the complex health and social factors which lead to so many vulnerable people ending up on our streets. That's why the committee's work included hearing from people with lived experience of homelessness, those working in frontline services and local and national policymakers who focus on addressing this complex issue. These stories shared with candour and courage demonstrated that homelessness can arise from a wide range of issues, ranging from relationship breakdowns to substance misuse, mental health issues, childhood trauma, as well as more recently, and most sadly, Westminster welfare reform. Although the government's approach has produced declines in homelessness applications, there are still local authorities where applications have increased. And our report therefore recommended ways to improve and expand the current housing options approach to deliver sustainable reductions. I'm pleased to note that the government's plan responds to many of the conclusions reached in the report, which, when implemented, will show Scotland as a leader in ending homelessness. The evidence we heard clearly made the case for a more collaborative approach between the wide range of organisations that are already performing outstanding work to help end homelessness. A concerted, whole system approach is key. From street work in Edinburgh, which offers access to amenities, support and immediate advice, as well as outreach services, to the Simon community in Glasgow offering emergency and temporary accommodation and 24-7 helpline support, to the Legal Services Agency in Glasgow, to Church's Action for the Homeless in Perth. All the committee's visits conveyed that there is indeed the will and ability to end homelessness in Scotland, provided we have the right policy framework in place to support these services. As part of our work programme, uh, uh, the committee also travelled to Finland, as Graeme Simpson mentioned, where we saw firsthand how the Housing First approach is delivering long-term sustainable reductions in homelessness. This approach not only prov provides housing, it also addresses other issues which can lead to homelessness, including the need for medical and psychological support, and was therefore included as a key recommendation in our report. 
Will we accept that Housing First alone cannot end homelessness? It will lay the groundwork for a successful person-centred approach to tackling it. As we're in the midst of the United Nations 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence campaign, I believe it's important to highlight Scottish Women Aid's written evidence to the Local Government Committee. Their contribution argued that gender-based violence is a major cause of homelessness in Scotland, citing the fact that of the 34,662 homelessness applications made in 2015-16, a dispute within household, violent and abusive, was the reason given by 4,135 applicants, some 13%, as Shona Robeson has pointed out. Research has highlighted that these figures may significantly underestimate the scale of the problem, as women do not, often disclose, do not always disclose that they are experiencing domestic abuse when making a homeless application. Domestic abuse is also closely linked with repeat homelessness, and families that experience domestic abuse are four times more likely to lose their homes due to arrears. Details such as this reinforce to the committee just how complex and multifaceted the causes of homelessness can be and underline the need for a person-centred approach which meet the individual needs of each vulnerable person. I'm heartened that this plan responds both to the themes and recommendations raised by the committee's report. There was a strong connection between the committee's conclusions and the recommendations made by the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. This provided a strong evidence base upon which the High Level Action Plan has been developed. With a significant shift towards a housing first model explored by the committee, this plan will help provide settled housing as a first response to people with multiple needs. And I look forward to local authorities agreeing their rapid rehousing transition plans by the end of this year. Just as the committee's report was built around the experiences of people who have been homeless, the plan sets out a person-centred approach to improved lived experiences. The respond, the, to respond to the highlighted need for accessible and clear information for homeless people, next year the Scottish Government will work with local authorities to make homelessness assessments more flexible and develop plans to make it as easy as possible for people to access their right to assistance. With regards to preventative action, the Government will develop pathways for groups at highest risk of rough sleeping and homelessness, such as sustainable housing on release for everyone standards for people leaving prison, which have already been, already been designed. I'm pleased that the plan makes specific reference to the particular needs of women and children fleeing domestic abuse. I hope this will go some way towards mitigating the desperately sad situation outlined by Scottish Women's Aid in their written submission. Presiding officer, in the face of an issue as multifaceted and complex as homelessness, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and disheartened by the challenges it presents. But this government is not complacent in the face of such difficulties. I'm sure it's heartened by the cross-party support for much of what it is doing and taking forward. I believe this plan has the potential to transform our response to homelessness and improve the lives of thousands of the most vulnerable people in our society. I hope that colleagues across this chamber will join me in supporting this plan today and ensuring that it delivers in the years and months ahead. Jackie Bailey, followed by Jenny Gilruth. Presiding officer is one of the very few members here since 1999. Whether I like it or not, I am part of this parliament's institutional memory. So I feel a certain responsibility to remind members of the past, in particular as the minister responsible for this policy area in the first Labour Scottish Government. So let me take you back almost 20 years, because I think it is instructive to do so. And I do so on the basis, as a politician once said, if you don't learn from history, you are doomed to repeat it. So homelessness and rough sleeping were both issues that the Parliament engaged with early on in its lifetime and where substantial progress was made in both legislative and resource terms. This mattered to the then Labour Lib Dem coalition government and to be frank, it mattered to Parliament as a whole, irrespective of party. At its most extreme, you could see the visible manifestation of homelessness on our streets, with rough sleepers not just across our cities, but in our towns too. Too many people were sofa surfing and the level of homeless applications was far too high. Now this spoke to a breakdown in the housing system, never mind a breakdown in society, with often the most vulnerable people suffering disproportionately. You could say exactly the same thing about the situation today. Action today as it was then is essential and it needs to be swift. There was a commitment to end rough sleeping by 2003, backed by £63 million in resources. And I can't help but contrast that with the £50 million announced by the Scottish Government in their Ending Homelessness Together Fund, which is not just for rough sleeping. A homelessness task force was established, bringing in those with expertise across the voluntary sector and local government to make sure we got it right. 
Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Groundbreaking legislation was backed by the Parliament in both the Housing Scotland Act 2001 and the Homelessness Scotland Act of 2003. Significant resources were allocated to implement a suite of recommendations, but when the SNP removed ring fencing and rolled the money up into the general settlement, there were cuts, especially in the last few years when local government funding has been cut by the SNP. So I very much welcome the work of the homelessness and prevention group. But let me say this to you. When you consider its report, alongside that of the Homelessness Task Force some 16 years earlier, they are remarkably similar. The same set of challenges remain. The need for prevention, tackling the root cause of homelessness. The need to tackle the problems of those in transition, leaving prison, the forces, or care, not having settled accommodation to go to mental health problems, physical health problems, addictions. The more I read, the more it echoes the past. Limiting the use of temporary accommodation featured then, it still features now. Shelter has campaigned for minimum standards for temporary accommodation since 2011. But the SNP want us to wait till 2023. In the intervening 16 years, homelessness and rough sleeping both fell initially. There were fewer rough sleepers on our streets. There was adequate emergency accommodation. Temporary accommodation became available to reduce and all but eliminate the use of bed and breakfasts. Priority need, intentionality, local connection, all legislated for. This was nothing short of a revolution in how we tackled homelessness in this country. But at some point, the eye was taken off the ball. Homelessness is unfortunately now rising. So too is rough sleeping. No, I think you should listen. It wasn't a political priority anymore. In fact, look closely. There's one motion, one mention of homelessness in the SNP's 2007 manifesto. There's nothing at all, nothing at all in their 2011 manifesto. Not one single solitary word on the subject. In that time, the SNP government stopped funding homeless charities to help the many Scots that end up homeless on the streets of London. In 2014, the Infrastructure Committee <coughs> rightly warned the government about the inappropriate use of housing options as gatekeeping, but it took a further two years for guidance to emerge. In 2015, the SNP government repeatedly refused to do rough sleeping counts to evidence the growing problem, and we asked them time and time again. It's only when there is a massive public outcry and media attention that something gets done. And you know, the reason I bring this up, presiding officer, is that I don't want to be back here in 20 years time debating the same thing all over again. If we think this is important for individuals who are homeless now, and for those who may find themselves homeless in the future, then we need to find solutions and stick to them. The cabinet secretary says that this is groundbreaking. Sorry, but it was groundbreaking before. You can't adopt a year zero approach and have no responsibility for your actions over the last decade. The government of the day of whatever complexion needs to commit to delivering on this agenda. We need resources, we need an action plan, we need targets, and parliament needs to hold their feet to the fire. We know what the problems are. We know what we need to do. And those in the voluntary sector need to, and do, constantly remind us of this. But the Scottish Government has taken its eye off the ball. We cannot let that happen again. And if you had one iota of the passion demonstrated by Kezia Dugdale this afternoon, I might have more confidence in what you're proposing. Jenny Bullruth, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to today's debate. The action plan published on Tuesday points to the government's commitment and ambitions to eradicate homelessness in all its forms. On the same day in the Chamber, the government acknowledged 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Today, we all wear our white ribbons in solidarity with the White Ribbon Campaign, a campaign to end men's violence towards women. Presiding Officer, women's experiences of homelessness are unique. 
As the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group recommendations note, groups with particular needs, such as women who have experienced domestic violence, are at particular risk of homelessness. As a former member of the Parliament's Local Government and Communities Committee, I would therefore like to reflect today on our inquiry into homelessness. In written evidence to the committee, Scottish Women's Aid confirmed that domestic abuse continues to be a major cause of homelessness in Scotland. In 2015-16, 4,135 homelessness applicants applied under a dispute within household, violent or abusive, as the reason for the application. 72% of applications were made by women and women with children, making up 36% of applicants. A 2010 government review of domestic abuse, housing and homelessness policy and research stated the prevention or cessation of domestic abuse in a family context will almost always require the women to leave that home. Between 2013 and 2015, Scotland's, uh, Scottish Women's Aid worked in my constituency alongside Fife's community research team in the production of the report Change, Justice, Fairness, which focused on women's experiences of homelessness when presenting to the local authority. 58% of Fife Council staff agreed that some women claim domestic abuse when they have not experienced it. That narrative, that idea of not being believed, weaves its way through the research report as women documented their experiences of presenting to the council. One individual was advised by Fife Council to give up her tenancy because her abusive ex-partner had accrued substantial debt in her name. Women were asked if they felt they had a choice about remaining in their home or moving out. 84% said they had none. I was glad, therefore, to note in the Labour Party's amendment today a specific reference to the work being done by the Chartered Institute for Housing in this area. And indeed, the Ending Homelessness Action Plan acknowledges that prevention of homelessness must recognise the particular needs of particularly women and children uh, fleeing domestic abuse. Presiding officer, I want to turn now to consider the root causes of homelessness um, and uh, the Local Government Committee's report. And I note uh, Graeme Simpson referred to our inquiry as a harrowing experience. Um, I note, however, that he did not make a single reference to uh, the numerous representations we received from third sector organisations in terms of welfare reform. So let me now remind him what they told us. Mm -hmm. Shelter told the committee that the rollout of welfare reform and universal credit was creating a complicated landscape to navigate and pushing people further into poverty. Yeah. COSLA highlighted that universal credit was squeezing local authority budgets as they were having to mitigate the impact of welfare reform. In Fife, the council has had to set aside £200,000 to cover the rollout of universal credit and has spent over a million pounds on costs relating to it. Scottish Women's Aid told the committee cuts to social security have had a grotesquely disproportionate impact on women. From 2010 to 2020, 86% of net savings raised through cuts to social security and tax credits will come from women's incomes. And across the United Kingdom, the number of homeless families has risen by more than 60%, and it is likely to have been driven by the United Kingdom government's welfare reforms, according to a National Audit Office report published last year. So Graeme Simpson is absolutely right to say there is a scandal, but perhaps the real scandal is that not a single Conservative MSP can admit to the damage that Tory welfare is causing homeless people in this country. Presiding officer, there has been some debate recently as to the purpose of this institution. Mitigation was considered uh, consistently revisited by the committee during our evidence sessions. On this point, the minister, Kevin Stewart, told the committee, the Scottish Government can mitigate a number of things. Bedroom tax mitigation costs £47 million a year, and we have talked a number of times today about using the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that 18 to 21-year-olds whose housing benefit is being withdrawn are still helped, and we have also put additional money into discretionary housing payments in recent times. But we cannot mitigate every aspect of the cuts that are being made. That, for me, is the crux of this debate. The Scottish Government, irrespective of who holds political power in here, was never created to guard the people of Scotland against Tory austerity. And much as I enjoyed Jackie Bailey's history lesson earlier, mitigation is not one of our founding principles. The argument advanced by Labour is that there were there to be an alternative government in Westminster, that would solve the problem. Austerity is ideologically driven, and without the Conservatives in power, these degrading welfare reforms would simply disappear. Our homelessness population would be saved. Forgive me, because I do not and I cannot subscribe to this. We all heard Kezia Dugdale's palpable anger and her contribution. But just three short years ago, the Labour Party abstained on the Welfare Reform and Work Bill. The bill passed by a majority of 184, 184 Labour MPs abstained. So I say to the Scottish Labour Party today, we can have a nice fluffy debate about discussing how terrible homelessness is, we can all commit to do something about it and welcome the action plan, but until the full welfare powers are devolved to this parliament and are put in the hands of the Scottish Government, we will never be able to tackle the root causes of homelessness. 
Integrity, compassion, wisdom, truth. They are the principles which should guide us all in our work in here. But perhaps I should leave the final word to one of the women who contributed to the report produced by Women's Aid. You're destroyed. I mean, yeah, you eat, you drink, you sleep, you talk, but you're dead inside and you can feel it. You can feel so down, so low, you wish the floorboards would open up and swallow you. It's so embarrassing. Yeah, you just think, oh gosh, I should have let him kill me because that would have ended it. It's just agony, agony, agony. So to the Labour Party and to the Conservatives, help us to stop this agony. Help your constituents. Back the full devolution of welfare powers to really st uh, help Scotland's homeless. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, I welcome the government bringing forward this debate. Um, and I think it is very important. And I also very much welcome the Minister's um, willingness to accept the amendment um, in my colleague's name. Um, I should start by also declaring that I am a, a director of a homelessness charity here in Edinburgh. I think there is a real problem, and Kedja Dugdo definitely hit um, the nail on the head in regard to her comments about short-term lets and BBs, particularly here in Edinburgh. But I think we do want to draw a distinction, and I would welcome the Minister to clarify going forward his definition in regard to those uh, B&Bs and hostels which have no support with them compared to those hostels and B&Bs that do have support. Because I think there is um, a real difference between the two. Here in Edinburgh and across uh, central Scotland, there are uh, many uh, short-term um, B&Bs and accommodations which have support and give uh, help to those who are there. Crossreach, Salvation Armour, Foursquare, Gower Care, Bethany Christian Trust, all provide that here in Edinburgh and across other parts of Scotland. And that comes with that short-term help, but it also comes with debt advice, uh, counselling advice, and other support that round. And I would be concerned that with the Minister's good intentions, that these type of organisations and these types of short-term lets were, were wrapped up all together and we saw them go. We need to make a difference. Uh, the Minister um, referenced the Heriot Watt report, which came out earlier this week. And I think it does make um, a very helpful comment in regard to distinguishing between different types of accommodation standards that we have across Scotland and perhaps particularly here in Edinburgh. We, we do want people to have professional help, whether it's short-term or long-term help that they require. And I hope that in any definition that comes forward in any new legislation, then we can make sure that these groups aren't affected. I think the other area that we need to highlight and we need to be careful when we're going forward in regard to any new legislation is that in regard to who are supporting short-term uh, night support. So, for example, in Glasgow, Glasgow City Mission, here in Edinburgh, Bethany, Bethany Christian Trust offer uh, accommodation for one night or for several nights in church halls where there's a mattress, there's a hot meal, and again, some professional support. Um, I don't think any of us want to have these type of uh, need for these type of um, accommodation, but also we don't want to see them go because what would happen to those individuals? So when we are drafting any new legislation, we have to make sure that there are proper um, exemptions um, and proper groups. And I understand that sadly these night shelters are seeing an increase in numbers, not actually uh, so far necessarily due to, as we've heard from welfare reform, but for lots of other reasons as well. And we do need to make sure that these individuals are supported. I mean, it still disappoints me that Edinburgh Council give no financial support to the night shelter. And I do welcome that the government has helped out in previous years in regard to that. And I hope maybe the minister can look at that again. Finally, can I turn to uh, the um, amendment uh, by the Greens? I mean, I think as was pointed out by Mike Rumbles, this will just have unforeseen circumstances if we support it. For example, if I'm a, a person whose perhaps mother or father dies with a house 
and I'm not sure what to do with it. I may want to let it out for a short period of time, but if I'm then being suddenly told I can never sell it for any reason, uh, then why would I go about that? Andy Whiteman. I take what he says, but the, the member says, but the, 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 the amendment in my name talks about reviewing, reviewing the current law, in particular section uh, uh, Schedule 3. It says nothing about any specific changes that may be made. I may have articulated those, but the amendment simply asks for a review. What's wrong with the review? Jeremy Balfour. Well, I, I suppose the member has articulated what he would want to see, and if you're going to review something, you've got to review it for a purpose. And the only purpose I can see if there's going to be a change in the law is to stop people bringing forward property, particularly here in Edinburgh and in other parts of Scotland, where there will simply be less and less rented accommodation available. And we could end up with more and more kind of homelessness and also people using their houses for holiday lets and other things where they get that protection. So I, I just simply think um, it is perhaps not being thought out uh, properly. This is an important issue. And I do think, by and large, there is a consensus within this parliament. And we do need to do something. And I welcome the government's moves so far. And um, I do agree with others that we cannot get delayed in delaying this too long. This is an urgent issue. And I think if the government seeks to work cross-party and quickly, it will get the support of other groups within this parliament. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you, Mr. Balfour. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by James Dornan. Mr. Dornan is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms. McGuire, please. Presiding Officer, everyone needs a safe, warm place that they can call home. It's more than just a physical place to live. And as MSPs, I'm sure we'll all know through our casework um, full well the toll that a lack of such a place can take on folk. Um, the security and routes that home provides are absolutely essential to physical and emotional health and well-being. And indeed, under Article 25 of the Universal Human Rights Declaration, everyone has a fundamental human right to housing. Scotland already has some of the strongest rights for homeless people in the world. Here, everybody found to be homeless is legally entitled to housing, and most people are provided with settled permanent accommodation. Huge progress in tackling homelessness has been made, but there is so much more to do. I welcome the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan and the fact that the Scottish Government accepts all of the 70 recommendations. And I thank the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group for all their hard work. This is a plan which has people and prevention at the centre, with a shift towards rapid rehousing, which will see homeless people housed in long-term and settled accommodation solution that meets their needs as soon as possible. And the together part of the plan is really important. Ending homelessness will need Scottish Government, COSLA, local authorities, third and public sector bodies all working together. Now, members will have received briefings from a number of organisations who will ultimately be part of the work that sees the aim of the plan, that everyone has a home that meets their needs and homelessness is ended. I think it's a measure of the quality of the work that's been done that the majority of stakeholders have warmly welcomed the proposed actions. Scottish Women's Aid strongly welcomed the renewed focus of the Scottish Government on prevention, however highlight their disappointment at what they describe as a missed opportunity to consider the distinct gender differences and underlying causes of women's homelessness. I agree with them when they say that whilst people experiencing homelessness will share common experiences, an understanding of women and children's distinct experience and the underlying cause of the risk of homelessness is absolutely essential. Women's economically disadvantaged position in the labour market, often in part-time, low-paid, sometimes precarious work, managing child and other caring responsibilities, means that they're disproportionately dependent on the social housing sector. During this 16 days of action, as many of us in this chamber wear white ribbons to show our support for the eradication of violence against women, it would seem, not to, it would seem ridiculous not to highlight that domestic abuse is a major cause of women's homelessness in Scotland. Scottish Government homeless statistics from 1718 tell us that a dispute within the household, violent or abusive, was given as the main reason for homelessness by 4,395 applicants, 78% of whom were women, and more than half had children on their application. 
In fact, more women make a homeless application under this category than for any other reason. The recent e EHRC report on the state of equality and human rights in Scotland highlighted the evidence prevented so far does not capture hidden homelessness. And as we know, these figures around women's homelessness will not really show the full extent of the issue as many women who are fleeing domestic abuse will often stay in various insecure housing situations or with family or friends before making a homeless application. Domestic abuse is both a cause and a consequence of women's inequality. The Scottish Government's equally safe strategy recognises this and highlights homelessness as a factor that can keep women and girls trapped in an abusive home. Earlier this week, the Cabinet Secretary responded positively to my question around the importance of embedding equality and human rights impact assessments in work to ensure that unlike the UK government policies, which the UN rapporteur assessed as being as if they were compiled by a room full of misogynists who were tasked with making a system that worked better for men, but not women, that we can and will do better here in Scotland and address structural inequalities faced by women and girls. In closing, I welcome the aims and the proposed actions in this plan, but I have to ask the government to reflect on whether embedding an equalities and human rights approach would have resulted in a plan that better recognised existing inequalities experienced by women and girls and ensured that they were recognised and not repeated and enforced. And I would also ask that in summing up, the government um, address the points raised by Scottish Women's Aid and the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations around the need for greater understanding of the gendered nature of homelessness. Thank you. I call James Dorn and then we move to closing speeches. Mr Dornan, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the dubious pleasure, I suppose, of sleeping out rough in Hamden Park and obviously it was for two reasons one is was to fundraise and the other one was to highlight the issue of homelessness and rough, speak, uh, rough sleeping now for me it was an uncomfortable cold kind of difficult evening but the truth is that I never was under any threat I never had to worry about being assaulted any criminal actions taken against me uh, violent or, or non-violent like many of the people that we, we know that live on the streets. And the other, uh, recently, more recently than before, I've been speaking to a lot of homeless people and asking them what takes them out there, what, why they've ended up in such a place. And the stories would just break your heart. I spoke to one woman uh, who told me that she's on the street because her husband had slashed her and stabbed her in the throat and she had to run away and she was looking for a hostel for the evening. This was in Edinburgh. I spoke to a guy last night who had come to Edinburgh to get work with a relative. The job fell through and he was trying to scrape together 20 pounds to spend a night in a hostel. Now, that is no way for anybody to live. It's just not the right thing for anybody to have to put up with. And it's tragic because we can do what we can. We can give them a couple of pounds. We can, you know, give them something to eat, but we can't solve, as individuals, I mean, we can't solve the long-term problem. That is ultimately the responsibility of the Scottish Government and the rest of society. But, so, so anyway, that, that's one of the reasons. These, these are a couple of the reasons why I'm, I'm pleased to get the opportunity to speak in this today. We're, in we're still in November, and November's a month where we remember those who uh, sacrificed and spent time in the, the Army and Air, Air Force and Navy. And also, I know that veterans are a group of people who are very often affected by homelessness. That very often when they come out of the services, they come out with a number of conditions. They come out with not being able to reintegrate into the civil society very easily with PTSD. They might go and stay with families, find that the conditions they've got make that sort of living almost impossible and very often end up with mental health issues and, and staying on the street. So I had, uh, very briefly, I had contacted the housing associations in Glasgow and they were all very positive in their responses and some said they would improve their actions. Some said that they would uh, bring actions forward. And GHA, from the weekly group, said that what they would do is put aside 10 houses a year 
for uh, veterans to make sure that they could get houses. Now, Graham Day, uh, the minister talked about this in the chamber, I think, and he, what is it he said? Oh, I can't remember what he said. Uh, it was from Graham, it wouldn't be that important anyway. But uh, he said, this initiative will help achieve the ambition that Scotland should become the destination of choice for those leaving the armed forces. But it's only if other people get behind the actions that, that the organisation such as GHA has taken. Now, I was, uh, I was speaking on the debate on Tuesday, Me Too debate on Tuesday, and it was an incredibly powerful and emotional debate for anybody that was in. And I gave the story of, of uh, one of my constituents. And a theme that came through time and time again was she was a, a repeated victim of domestic abuse. And time and time again, one of the issues was that she had to flee. She had to flee and she had to try and find somewhere else to start again. And there was just no place of safe refuge for that unfortunate young woman to, to relax even for a brief period of time. And it just added to the pressures that were going to put on her, which probably in some cases led her to make more bad choices, which led her to be abused again and the cycle goes on and on. So it's important, domestic violence has been talked about a lot just now eh, and we had some great contributions about that today and it's important that that is at the centre of what the Scottish Government are looking to do in their Ending Homelessness Together action plan. Now, I welcome the money, I welcome the £50 million, I welcome the rapid rehousing, but obviously we have to make sure that the, the, this domestic violence issue is dealt with. We can't have people who are in a a situation that I can't bear to think about having to wake up every morning and not have the opportunity to escape from that because you can't think of anywhere to go or have a stop where they could get the advice that's required. And I, before I finish, I, 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 just, I just have to touch on Jackie Bailey's contribution. Um, Jackie talked about uh, you know, the, the Scottish Government and things have got worse over the last 10 years. Now, it can't just be me, but I'm fairly confident that something happened about 10 years ago where there was a financial crash, there was a change of government in 2010, there was deliberate austerity, there was, there's even been UK audit reports that put the blame exactly where it should go, and that's at the Westminster government. What, what's happening is, as our budgets are cut, as the need is growing stronger, we are doing everything we can. The Scottish government... <laughs> I think you should listen. Uh, the, Scot the, the Scottish government... Yeah. The Scottish Government are doing what they can under extremely serious circumstances. This is a very good action plan. Everybody should be getting behind it and we should be looking to make sure that the, this conversation that we are having just now, we don't have to have in another five or six years' time because we're much closer to closing that gap than we ever have before. So what I would say to everybody in this chamber is, let's get behind the action plan, let's make sure that we make life better for those that are sleeping rough and homeless, and let's make sure we do it as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Andy Whiteman to close the Green Party. Mr Whiteman, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I just first of all, I'd like to echo James Dornan's point there about getting behind uh, the action plan. Despite the differences in opinion, we've heard this, uh, this afternoon, um, I think there's a lot in this action plan uh, that's going to be helpful, and I, I agree we should get uh, behind it. I think all members uh, would agree that. Uh, we've heard some quite interesting contributions. I very much welcome Pauline McNeill's um, observation that homelessness is as much, if not more, a health issue. Um, housing uh, homelessness is a, is a sickness. Uh, housing is a cure uh, and many people are thrown into homelessness because of health issues and many people's health issues are tackled by having that very basic human right, uh, a home. In fact, in June this year, Crisis uh, published some research showing that a spend of £965 million would deliver £2.65 billion of benefits across justice, health uh, and other portfolios by fundamentally sorting out one of the key issues that leads to people ending up in prisons, ending up uh, in hospitals, ending up uh, in the streets. Kezia Dugdale made a very, very powerful speech articulating the direct lived experience uh, of many people, far, far too many people, not just in Edinburgh, but across Scotland, the United Kingdom uh, and Europe, including two who are tragically uh, now uh, dead. The Cabinet Secretary in her opening remarks talked about housing being a human right and that was echoed by one or two other uh, members. But it's fairly clear to me that people's human rights to housing are being violated. 
Uh, and it's not an easy job to hold governments or whoever else to account under the human right uh, to housing, because it's not part of the European Convention uh, on Human Rights. I welcome the establishment of the government's Homeless Prevention and Strategy Group. I would just invite the minister, I've looked at the membership of that group, I understand the minister chairs that uh, group, uh, to ensure that on that group are some homeless experienced people. I will. Minister. Um, I can assure Mr White, I co-chair the group with Councillor Eleanor Whitham um, of COSLA, who herself has lived experience of homelessness, and a number of other folks on that group have lived experience of homelessness. So we're not doing this in isolation. We have folk around that table who know what it's like. Andy White. Thank you very much, Mel. Welcome that uh, uh, commitment. Jackie Bailey reviewed the history of this Parliament's efforts in the field of homelessness, and it's not a happy uh, story, and underscores how much work there is still to do. Other members, uh, Gillian Martin, Oliver Mundell and Emma Harper, talk in particular about hidden homelessness, homelessness in rural areas, which is often hidden, particularly in areas like Aberdeenshire, which are frequently regarded as being otherwise quite uh, prosperous. And I would echo that, knowing personally uh, a number of uh, people and communities having worked in them over the past few years in places like Applecross, more than 50% of the houses there are holiday and second homes. And that's why I think it's fundamentally important that in the planning system, such uses are subject to planning uh, constraints. In places like Applecross, local folk can't afford to live and the economy is suffering. Over parts of the west coast of Scotland, people, workers with jobs, with sometimes fairly decently paid jobs, are living under upturned boats. The Cabinet Secretary talked about Scotland being in the global uh, forefront. Uh, in this uh, Everybody In report that Crisis produced, um, they have a table on page 395, um, and they talk about what a perfect homelessness system would look like across Great Britain. They have 10 principles and they assess them on a traffic light system, red, amber, green, across England, Wales, and Scotland. There are three green dots. Scotland has two, Wales has one. Of those three countries, Scotland is doing best. But the European Federation of National Organizations Working with Homelessness, their third overview of housing exclusion in Europe 2018, identified only one country in Europe that really has successfully tackled this problem, and that is Finland. So even in a country like Scotland, where we've seen a 40% drop in homelessness applications, we still have extremely serious problems. And a key driver in that has been the long-term decline in public housing since the 1980s. I welcome the government's attempt to begin to reform that, to change it, to turn around. The 50,000 homes target is welcome. The action plan reminds us that of the government's commitment, and I quote, to build 50,000 affordable homes. In May 2018, at First Minister's Questions, Patrick Harvey asked the Scottish First Minister whether the SNP's manifesto commitment, and I quote, we will invest three billion to build at least 50,000 more affordable homes over the next five years, still stands, and the First Minister said yes. But the housing stats show that of the 50,000 target that the government claims to have, uh, the gov of the 50,000 target, the government claims to have delivered 15,870 in 2016-17 and 2017-18, but only 9,942, or 62% of that, are actually new build. The government has abandoned its manifesto commitment. I will. Minister. Uh, we have allowed flexibility and will deliver 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 of those for social rent. In a number of areas, um, it may not be possible uh, to build new, and we have allowed local authorities the flexibility to buy back homes, to take them back into social stock in areas where it may not be possible to build. We will deliver 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 of those for social rent. And I welcome that intervention. I just remind the uh, Minister that the First Minister c c confirmed that it's the SNP manifesto commitment to build those affordable homes rather than just to uh, deliver them. I just want to conclude. Uh, have I got another 40 seconds? <laughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, this report, which is a very weighty tome by everybody uh, by crisis, uh, has a quote from Claire in Edinburgh. I was married for 18 years, but it turned into a very abusive relationship. 
I went to the council and they put me in a hostel. It was horrible. I went to the council to ask for somewhere else, but they said there was nothing available. And if I didn't go back, I'd be intentionally homeless. I was too scared. I didn't want to be around these people. My mental health was really struggling and I was beginning to turn to drink. Now I just bid on council flats while trying to make enough money during the day to get a room in a backpacker's hostel. It's sometimes in a shared room, but it's much safer and it's usually with okay people. Otherwise, I sleep on the street. I still see my son every day. I go to street work, a homeless charity here in Edinburgh to clean up every morning. Then I pick him up from home and take him to his baby group just to spend time with him. I don't know what will happen. I'm just trying to keep going. I don't want to live like this. Presiding officer, let's make sure that stories like Claire's like the constituents that Kezia Dugdale referred to, are no longer stories that we have to stand up in this chamber and rehearse. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can remind members they should be in the chamber for closing speeches if they've taken part in a debate. And now call on Mark Griffin to close for Labour, please. Thank you, President Officer. The inescapable fact uh, from today, today's debate is that for the first time in a number of years, um, homelessness is rising. We've heard from a number of speakers um, varying opinions and various theories as to why that is happening. But at the end of the day, what that means is that more people are going without the safety, warmth and comfort of having a roof over their head. And the infrastructure to deal with this humanitarian crisis simply can't cope. The Kezia Dugdale called out Edinburgh Council, which has left 466 families in this city suffering in temporary accommodation for longer than seven days. And some of the heartbreaking examples that brought that to life, breaking the law and the process. Graeme Simpson spoke about the need for Parliament to agree to limit the use of temporary accommodation to a maximum of seven days beyond just a consultation as the plan offers. And I look forward to seeing urgent legislation from the, the Minister. My colleague, Polly McNeill, spoke about the gendered and sometimes intersectional nature of homelessness affecting single people and women and children, those who have been victims of domestic abuse, those who have experienced a relationship breakdown, as well as young people generally. And underlining what Polly McNeill said is the call in our amendment today, where the actions will fall on um, local councils, registered social landlords and the third sector um, who will need uh, the resources to make the action plan a reality. Small pot after small pot of cash re-announced simply won't cut it. So we'll have to wait until the budget to see if they'll get the support to need um, to carry this plan forward. The prevention is a thread that runs through the plan and the debate today. The Scottish ministers have um, said prevention is just as important as how we collectively respond if and when homelessness does happen. Prevention is always better um, than addressing a crisis situation, but to be worthwhile, there needs to be action put in place. And for all the efforts of this chamber, successive governments to pre prevent homelessness since 1999, something has, fairly, has, has clearly failed that we are yet again revisiting it. In the North Lanarkshire Council area, Homelessness applications have shot up by almost 15% in the last year, reversing a downward trend following changes to the allocation policy and housing option interventions. The onslaught of universal credit from this Tory government and crippling um, budget cuts fly in the face of the plans and efforts that have gone before. The, the red flags, the financial crisis, Tory budgets and the rollout of universal credit should have been plain to see and act upon. Um, but it's the, the impact of universal credit, along with affordability issues in the private rented sector, which is now an emerging cause of homelessness locally. Uh, though North Lanarkshire is twice as likely to, revolve, to resolve someone's homelessness application, the extent of the risk posed by universal credit is inescapable. In the four months of rollout to August, the number of people in arrears for their rent almost tripled, the council's rent deficit jumping by one million pounds, and a quarter of people on universal credit in North Lanarkshire Council are now in debt to that council. And I want to call on the chamber to think about how we help um, and how we act to help people in that situation. When we look back 
at what the chamber has we've done in this chamber in the past about the, the bedroom tax. We acted, yes, we had to react and mitigate, but we did so as a preventative measure because it removed the risk of not sustaining a tenancy. Last week, I asked the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security to begin consideration of a move to an automatic landlord payment of universal credit. In April, this Parliament decided split payments should be made automatically and coupled with an opt-out for those who chose not to. So why not with landlord payments? The first Scottish choices were proposed and passed to a lot of, a lot of fanfare. And at the time, we possibly even um, looked over the submissions that we had from Parkhead um, Housing Association, Aberdeen and Highland Councils, as well as um, Prospect Community Housing, who called for such an opt-out. Highland Council said uh, the Council believes the Scottish Government flexibilities provides the opportunity to deliver a more fundamental shift by enabling housing costs to be paid directly to social landlords as standard. In the situation we have at the moment, landlords can request the, uh, direct payments, but that's after eight weeks of arrears and debt has been built up in a household. Um, why not switch that um, choice around from um, automatically going to a landlord to an automatic payment to a tenant so that they can pursue and um, they, they are then left with a situation where they're always um, secure in their tenancy they know that their rent will go direct to the landlord and their tenancy will always be secure now just today the Scottish Government published evidence um, from the experience panels um, explicitly around um, the issue of Scottish choices and I'll close, President Officer, just by reading out some of the comments that were made in that um, evidence panel exercise. One member of the, the evidence panel said, I think direct to the landlord is the best way. People on the bed line will too easily dip into it if needs arise. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but protect your roof at all costs. Another one said, personally, I would have preferred payments sent to my landlord as I ended up in debt. Also being paid monthly left me in debt. I was never offered any other choice. A third one said I would prefer it paid straight to the landlord so that if there were any issues, it would come straight from the DWP and I wouldn't get into trouble. I, I would just ask the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister to reflect on the evidence coming through those experience panels um, and remain open to the option of an automatic um, payment through universal credit to a landlord to secure people's tenancies in the first instance um, and prevent some of that homelessness that occurring. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I call on Michelle Ballantyne to close for the Conservatives, please. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, before I start, can I just um, direct people to my register of interest because of the trustee of an estate that was left to the people. I do through that manage tenancies and holiday lets. Um, thank you for asking me to close today on behalf of the Conservatives because I think this is a really important debate. Homelessness, as many people in this chamber, and, and Jackie Bailey not least of all, has been something that governments have grappled with for a long, long time. And it's been subsequent um, governments and it's been parties of all colours um, that have talked about this, looked at this. And it is not a situation in the chamber where some people are saying, oh, this is not an issue, and others are saying it is. We all agree it is an issue, and we all agree it is something that we need to come together to sort out. And for that reason, I think we've all come to some consensus here in agreeing that we support the action plan that the Scottish Government have brought out, and we want to assist in any way we can in taking it forward and to make sure that as the years go forward, we do see a reduction in homelessness. Now, it's quite clear that it is complex, and I'm not going to stand here and say that welfare benefits have nothing to do with it. Of course they do. Everything contributes. But they are not the one and only reason. Um, and it is important that as we talk about it and as we look at it, we look at all the different reasons and we address all the different reasons. And the UK government today is engaging in that conversation and has in fact released guidance specifically today on how to, um, for vulnerable people, and people particularly who are suffering from homelessness, how they engage with the welfare benefit system and how they can actually get help and make sure they access everything that they're entitled to. 
So they have reacted to the, to the comments, to the reports that have come out, and they're working closely with many of those agencies. And I think we don't do ourselves any service, and we do a huge amount of disservice to people who are homeless if we don't work together to actually resolve this. Yes, if you like. Gillian Martin. In, in that statement that you've just mentioned from the UK government, have they made any uh, declaration that of all the agencies that have been mentioned by many people in this chamber that are very critical of universal credit, they will engage with them to ask them just exactly what it is about universal credit that they think is so damaging? Michelle Bellington. Yes, I mean, they are actually reacting to some of what Shelter said, so ex they are doing exactly that. Um, and I, I think it is, it is not correct to suggest that they are not listening, that they are not talking to them. Um, like all of us, um, they, are, they are being lobbied in the same way as we are being lobbied in this parliament, and they're engaging in those conversations. So I'm, I'm going to make a little bit of progress, if you don't mind. Um, so it does enjoy support from all, all elements of this chamber, the action plan. Um, and I want to thank my colleague, Graham Simpson, for his work on this issue. Um, and, of course, the charity crisis did highlight in their recent report many of the issues facing people in unsuitable accommodation. And this is something that Graham Simpson um, took on board and has been working. And it, it forms the basis of the amendment we brought forward today. Because, like all the evidence that's brought forward, it's one that we, we couldn't ignore. Um, and I've certainly had a lot of representations on this in the last week or so. Now, the amendment um, was brought in, in good faith. We don't want to see people sitting in unsuitable accommodation. And I think Kezia Dugdale's contribution on this was extremely angry and passionate. And um, um, for every good reason, it is unthinkable that somebody should be sitting for weeks or months in accommodation that, you know, you would never dream of walking into and saying, this is livable and somebody should go in here. Now, at the same time, if they have to, if there's absolutely nowhere else to put a roof over their head, we need to get them out as soon as possible and, and into good accommodation. And so I am absolutely delighted that today's debate started with um, the Minister actually standing up and saying, we're going to look at that and we're going to bring that forward and we're going to make sure that we do something about it. Um, and I think on that basis, um, we'll look forward, and I'm sure Graham, uh, as our housing spokesperson, will look forward to working with you on that to make sure that we address the whole issue of temporary accommodation. So I think we've made some real progress today on that. Um, Pauline McNeill um, emphasised a lot around local government and the key role that they have to play. And uh, I would certainly agree with that as, as, as an ex-councillor. You know, many of the stuff comes back to councils to deal with, and it, it, the buck stops with the council to actually get people the help they need. And again, the minister confirmed today that he does agree with that, um, and that he is going to look and ensure, and correct me if I'm wrong, minister, when you stand up, you said make sure they have the necessary resources, but I will, you know, we'll look forward to hearing more about that as we go forward. We've heard from a lot of people um, about the need to consider a gender dimension to homelessness. And it is certainly difficult, particularly if you have children and, and you are trying to get out of a situation. Having a roof over the head of your children is the most important thing to mothers particularly. You cannot take your children on the street. So the need to be able to move from wherever you are, from the situation to, to security, and not just security of a roof over your head, but security that you know that that partner who may be abusing you to the degree that you fear for your life, that security means that they can't get at you. So I think it is important that we, we take heed of that and we work together to ensure that there is the ability to move accommodation when you need it. Yes, okay. Ruth McGuire. I thank Michelle Valentine for taking the intervention. I just wonder if she would um, acknowledge that finance is used as a way of coercing women and stopping them from leaving and would she support our calls for split payments to be made at source on universal credit to stop that potential financial control and coercion. Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, I would absolutely agree that finance is used in coercion. It's one of the key issues um, that is often used. I think in terms of, of at source, I think there should be the option, certainly. I think there is, a, there is a complication and a difficulty, and I think that's something we'll have to work through because that coercion still exists when the money is separated, because if it is automatic, the partners will know about that anyway. 
So I think there's, there's some real complications we have to work through to ensure that women really do get the protection that they need. Um, we talked about uh, a number of members, Oliver Mundell sort of started, and it was reiterated by a number of members, about the hidden homelessness. And I think that is a really important element. Um, when I headed up the drug and alcohol unit, hidden homelessness was one of the big things because many of my clients did so for surf. They were bouncing from place to place, but they were not registered as homeless. Um, so I think that is something we need to actually make sure that we have a handle on as we go through this action plan. Um, he talked about the fact that it's important that tenants know their rights. Absolutely, tenancy law has changed. The 2016 Act changed it. And I, you know, I heard very strongly Kezia Dugdale's comments around why do we need to wait till 2023 to ensure that standards are implemented. And it's really interesting because stand, quality standards were implemented in 2015. So if you're social housing or if you're in um, public authority rented accommodation, but not temporary accommodation. And, and I think that was a real miss because it is the same people. Um, whether it was done to stage the cost of doing it, I don't know. But I think it was a miss, and I think it's something we should be looking at and trying to bring forward and get done as quickly as possible. Alexander Stewart reminded us, and, and many others did, that person-centred approach is important. Everybody's circumstances, when you become homeless or you're at threat at homelessness, are different. And it's really important we work with individuals and look at individuals' need. And I can see I'm going to run out of time. Do you want me to wind up? A few more seconds. Okay. So, I mean... I think to, to, to wind up, I think it is really important that, as I said already a million times, that we do bring it together. I'm afraid we can't support Andy Whiteman's um, amendment today, but we will be supporting um, Labour's. Um, and it is simply because I agree with what my colleague Jeremy Balfour said, that there are potentially unattended consequences. I think for Edinburgh, I absolutely understand the argument, and the argument's really important for Edinburgh, but maybe we need solutions for areas where there are difficulties, rather than a, 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 a whole, you know, a countrywide solution. Um, I just want to mention one little tiny thing. I'm afraid and you that's can. about making uh, supported accommodation is important. Thank even you. It's temporary. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, I call in Aileen. I don't call on Aileen Campbell to close. I have changed. I now call on Kevin Stewart to close for the government. Minister, please, till, uh, thank you, till decision time. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I think that this has been uh, a very good debate today uh, with some thoughtful contributions. Um, there has been passion. Uh, there has sometimes been anger, and rightly so, I think. Uh, but the level of commitment uh, shown here today to tackle and prevent homelessness and to do more for those experience it is uh, very reassuring. Uh, the Scottish Government wants Scotland to be a progressive and socially responsible nation where people are treated with fairness, dignity and respect and where there is no place for homelessness or rough sleeping. Uh, and we want to build on the strong homelessness rights and the radical changes to homelessness and affordable housing that our local and national government have delivered over the past decade, in partnership with housing providers, the third sector and others. Uh, and the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan uh, published this week, and everybody's been saying uh, the Scottish Government Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan, it's a Scottish Government COSLA document, uh, which also uh, had a lot of others adding to it, and I'm grateful uh, to all of them uh, for their efforts. So uh, let's, let's not just call it the Scottish Government uh, Action Plan. It is an important milestone uh, in realising our vision that everyone has a safe, warm home that meets their needs and that homelessness is ended. Uh, and the Action Plan is the culmination of two particular pieces of work. Firstly, the report and recommendations uh, presented earlier this year from the Scottish Parliament's Local Government and Communities Committee following its wide-ranging inquiry into homelessness. Uh, and I'd like to repeat my thanks to the committee and everyone who participated in that inquiry uh, for their valuable contribution. Uh, the work of the committee both complemented and informed the other significant piece of work, uh, that of the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group. Uh, their dedication, their hard work, uh, produced within a, a short period of time uh, that existed, um, came up with actions for preventing rough sleeping in winter 2017-18, which made an immediate tangible difference, and 70 bold recommendations, all of which we have accepted in principle. 
Uh, and I also want to repeat my thanks to all of the members of the Action Group for their commitment and for the incredible pace at which they worked in producing this comprehensive set of well-informed and detailed recommendations. I, I would also thank all of the partners who worked with HARSAG, including, of course, those who have lived experience uh, of homelessness uh, and who know better than any of us what needs to change. Uh, and beyond that, I would pay tribute to my civil servants for all of the hard work that they have had getting us to this point. Uh, through I We Can, HARSAG undertook a programme of engagement uh, with 425 people across the country uh, to gain insight into their direct experience of homelessness, to hear about the issues that matter to them and what they wanted to see change and what would have helped better support them. Anyone who knows me uh, knows how important it is to me uh, that the views of those with lived experience of homelessness inform every step of this journey. Um, and we heard today from uh, Kezia Dugdale examples where the system has failed people. Uh, she was angry about that situation and I share her ire. Uh, and what I would say to, to Kezia Dugdale today is that I'm more than willing to meet the gentleman and his baby uh, that she talked about with her um, to hear about his experiences and she can be assured that I will do all that I can to ensure that a situation like that never happens again. I certainly will. Kezia Dugdale. For that offer and formally accept it, but would he also accept that there are systemic failures in the system when it comes to temporary accommodation and urge him once again to please bring forward those new national standards on temporary accommodation before 2023? But I, Minister. I thank Ms Dugdale for bringing that up again. Um, because uh, what we can do, um, and it is by 2023, uh, and that's dealing with legislation. But what I can commit to is that we can deal with guidance uh, in the early part of next year, early to mid next year, to get this absolutely right. To go further than that will require consultation, as Ms Dugdale knows, but I commit to dealing with that guidance situation long before 2023. Um, others in the debate have mentioned uh, numerous things. Let me, let me go with two points where uh, we're maybe not all entirely uh, in agreement. Um, because we heard earlier on uh, this afternoon uh, about uh, the situation of what happened in the past. Um, Suzanne uh, Fitzpatrick, Professor Suzanne Fitzpatrick, uh, was a member of the task force previously uh, that was mentioned this afternoon. She was also a member of HARSAG, uh, providing a useful link between the two. Uh, the, the two. Uh, HARSAG members themselves, uh, the majority of whom have long and consistent experience of the homelessness sector, agree that this plan is different this time. Because first of all, there's a commitment to tackle all homelessness and not just rough sleeping. Uh, and there is, this time, consensus across all sectors on what needs to be done and a commitment to do it. So that is what diff is different from, from what happened previously. The other point where I, I disagree with some members, and I don't want to uh, go on at length about this, is around about welfare reform. Um, I suggest that we, if we're going to accept all of the recommendations, all 70 recommendations of HARSAG, we also have to look at the recommendations that they have made around about welfare reform. And I hope that members across the chamber uh, can come together, can come together uh, to persuade uh, the UK government to change uh, their minds in some of that regards as well. Uh, President officer, um, there was talk today about swift action. Um, very, very briefly to, for Mr. Corey. Maurice Corey. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I, I, I thank the uh, Minister for taking the intervention. Um, with over 650 veterans in Scotland currently requiring housing, what is the Minister doing to have local authorities address this urgent need for the Armed Forces veterans? Minister. I'm disappointed, I'm disappointed um, President Officer, that Mr. Corey has come in late today and asked that question. 
Um, we have done a lot already in terms of investment into housing for veterans in Scotland. Mr Day and I have met with uh, point, uh, point officials of order, just recently. Which I suspect is not a point of order, but we will find out. I've actually been in this debate this afternoon, attending the in-chamber duty. You were in the debate this afternoon. We've made your point. Well, I, I, I apologise because I didn't spot Mr Corey, but Mr Day and I have, uh, have met recently with veterans' bodies and will continue to do so. I wish the MOD would do somewhat more uh, in terms of, of uh, dealing with the folks that they have um, responsibility for. Um, President officer, there's been a lot of things talked about today. One of the things which was touched upon was swift action. Uh, the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group uh, has made it clear its commitment to turn the actions into plans uh, and in the plans into reality. And we will meet on Tuesday um, and uh, I can assure you uh, that we are scrutinised uh, to a huge degree in that regard. Um, there were also mentions of the differences that there are in rural parts of Scotland by uh, Mr uh, Mundell uh, and by Gillian Martin. And we will continue to look at the differences. This is not just an urban problem, it is a problem in rural areas too, often hidden. We will continue uh, to look at all of that. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm not going to be able to touch on everything uh, that members have uh, spoken about today. Um, I will look at the official report and will re respond individually uh, to members about some of the points uh, that they have made today. The action plan itself reinforces what has always been clear to this group, that in addition to homelessness and housing services, we need partners across services, including health, education, social work, community support and justice, and the third sector to recognise and act when people they work with are at risk of homelessness. While there are good examples of partnership working, we know that we need to go much further. And if we are to achieve our ambitions to end homelessness, we must all identify and break down the barriers that prevent a truly joined up partnership approach within and across all sectors. Achieving that will be difficult, but I believe it's possible if we work together. We know that there are challenges as well as opportunities ahead. This is about changing culture, changing minds and changing behaviours. And we know it will not be easy. However, the prize here is to also succeed in transforming lives for the better. And this is more than worth the effort. I believe that this comprehensive action plan for real change can and will help us overcome the challenges and that we will go on to end homelessness together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on homelessness. And we're going to turn straight to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 14962.1 in the name of Graeme Simpson, which seeks to amend Motion 14962 in the name of Kevin Stewart on ending homelessness together, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 14962.3 in the name of Pauline McNeill, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Kevin Stewart, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 14962.2 in the name of Andy Whiteman, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Kevin Stewart, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14962.2 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 20, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 14962 in the name of Kevin Stewart as amended on ending homelessness together be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>